All right. So now that we're recording, let me get everything set up for the night and we will get started. So like I was saying, you know, a lot of students were caught in the damaged path of the storm, so they're not going to be here tonight. Uh, Chris is without any kind of internet access right now. He is um, stuck kind of between being offshore and home. Um, and he had to like go out to a helipad today just to get enough cell service to tell me that he couldn't make it to class. So I'm going to be covering for him tonight and we will just kind of move along from there. It's not going to be too hard. It won't be too bad of a night with it being a small class. Like I said, I'm going to kind of, I'll lecture a little bit, but I want you guys to be involved. Uh, tell me whenever we touch on something that you may have seen. I know this is an EMT basic class, so some of y'all don't have any actual experience on the trucks or in a fire department. Some of you do. Um, but even if you've only dealt with it with your own family or uh, a friend, you know, something like that, pitch in your experience. Um, just because you didn't wear a patch doesn't mean that you don't, you didn't come across something that may be useful or maybe worth talking about mentioning and that sort of thing for the classmates. The right button, there we go. All right. Whoops, let me do one thing before. That way I can actually see what people say. Chat. All right, I think we're good now. Yep, now I can see everything. Okay. So we'll get through these first couple slides and let's get started. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to kind of bring you guys back to a refresher of chapter six. I know, like I said, that chapter kicked everybody's tails, but that was because it was a big overview of everything that we had to do all at once. All the body systems were there. And I told you guys that once we got to module three and four, you were going to kind of start to go back and review, um, see all that stuff again. And we're going to start to focus more in on it. So tonight we're going to talk about the endocrine system as a whole. There's not a whole lot to know about at the EMT level. And I mean, even if you go on to higher levels of training, there's really not a whole lot more to learn about at advanced EMT or paramedic. You get a better understanding of it. But we really want you to know about the things that can go wrong with this system and what you would do to fix it. Now, don't expect you to be an endocrinologist or anything of that sort. Um, there's a lot of endocrine issues out there that people have that are major issues, but they're not really 911 issues, if that makes sense. They're going to be the kind of thing that they're going to be dealing with a long-term care plan at the hospital or at a clinic with their um, PCP, all that stuff. This is what they're, they're dealing with. So like hypothyroidism, we really don't deal with that, right? But one of the things we do deal with is diabetes. Uh, we're going to get into the nitty gritty about that tonight, talk about the two different types, what they mean, why they're different, how you would combat one versus the other, so on and so on. But let's talk about chapter six for a little bit. That was your anatomy chapter. And what I want to do tonight is just real quick, let's just go over um, the different parts of the anatomy and how this plays into things. So if you think about how your body reacts to things, for example, um, how you perceive cold, all right? Or um, anything that your body may do that's on a gradient, say how much it tries to cool you off or warm you up. Uh, how fast is your heart gonna beat? How much are you gonna urinate? Things like that, where it's not just a 100% on or off, there's a, there's a range to it. So that's what your endocrine system is responsible for in the sense that like your, your neurologic system, your brain, your, your, your nerves, you know, they're on or off, it's electric. So you're either, there's either no stimulus or there's full stimulus and that's it. But we don't operate that way. We operate where I might want some stimulus. I might want my heart rate to crank up some, but not skyrocket. I don't wanna go straight to redline in the engine. So the way that the body does that is the nervous system actually doesn't stimulate the heart directly, for example, right? So if, if I'm running a race and I need my heart rate to go up, my brain will eventually essentially tell my heart, hey, speed up. But it doesn't do that by shocking it. It's not like cracking the whip or anything. Uh, what will happen is my brain will say to my adrenal glands that sit on top of my kidneys, hey, I need more heart rate. So 
they'll start cracking the whip on the adrenal glands and the adrenal glands will secrete what? What's the big thing that comes from your adrenal glands that will help increase your heart rate and things of that sort? Insulin. Not insulin, no. Epinephrine. There you go. All right, so epi, which is what, if it's made in a lab, and we get it as a medication, we call it epinephrine, but it, essentially it's adrenaline. It's the same thing. Good job, Caesar. You wrote that down. Um, epinephrine and adrenaline are the same thing. One we create, the other one is created by the body, but they are the same chemical. They do the same thing. Um, that's why when we give epi, we're basically giving our patient an adrenaline rush. So that when the, when the brain zaps the adrenal glands and they release epinephrine, or uh, adrenaline in the body, it causes us to have a sympathetic nervous response. And I know you guys, at least I think you guys have already gone over neuro, so we don't have to dig into that. But now we're talking about how the neurologic system impacts the rest of the body, not just how it functions. All right, so that's one example where if I wanna get my heart rate to go from say 60 to 100, I will, my brain will zap my adrenal glands, I'll get so much out, that gets picked up by the heart, by the receptors. And then suddenly my heart gets to where I want it. When my brain says, all right, that's good. It stops torturing my adrenal glands and my adrenal glands stop secreting um, adrenaline and everything kind of stays where it's at. And then when my heart's ready to, or when my brain's ready to tell my heart to slow down, it zaps another gland. We get a different chemical. That chemical now binds to the receptors. And so now we're getting the opposite effect. So most everything that happens in the body, all of our organ functions, um, is controlled in some way at a cellular level by the adrenal, or not the adrenal, I'm sorry, by the endocrine system. That's what that system is used for. And there's a bunch of different organs. You have your thymus, your thyroid, your hypothalamus, your pituitary gland, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the big one that I want you guys to know about in this class is going to be your adrenal glands, because that's where your adrenaline comes from. And know about your... Um, your pancreas, all right? Things like the spleen, we really don't worry too much about it. Um, we, the only thing that I really care about you guys knowing about that for EMT class is, did it rupture, right? That's, that may be a question you wanna ask your patient if they're talking about abdominal pain in a certain area. But um, I want you guys to think about the types of glands and organs that actually affect the body by what they secrete. Anything that is endocrine, and by, by the name of it, endocrine means that whatever chemical is in it is going to be squeezed out of the organ like a sponge. There's no duct work for that, right? Um, if there is a duct, if, it, if the um, organ sends out the chemical by a route, where, what do we call that? It's the opposite of endocrine. Now think about your med term here. So if we have endo, endo yeah, means- Are you talking about exo? Yep, so the exocrine system. What's a good example of an exocrine gland? A gland that secretes something to the outside. What do you, what do you think that would be? Are you talking about the bladder or like the kidneys? Mm, not so much those. Those are different um, systems. Think like sweat glands. Uh -huh. So yeah, your skin. Um, you have the glands that secrete the oil that keeps your skin smooth and, and kind of moist. You That way you're not dry. Um, your sweat glands count. Technically, they do that to keep you cooled off, but it's, just, it's for the same thing. Your, um, your body says, I'm, over, I'm overheating. So it zaps your, um, zaps your skin. And the glands in the skin are like, all right, cool. We're going to release some fluid. We're going to get some heat out. That's sweat. Those are exocrine glands. Uh, they're part of the same system as the endocrine system, but that's where the difference in the name comes in. What we're focusing on tonight is going to be those organs of the endocrine system. And, and like I said, we're mainly going to be working on um, things like the liver the um, and the pancreas, all right, because those two organs have a big part in diabetes. And that's gonna be the big disease that we're gonna be hitting on tonight. All right, so hematologic emergencies. What is hema? Hmm. 
when you're Blood. looking at sorry go ahead Blood. right good all right so we're going to talk about issues that may be protect issues with the blood and what's in it all right so for example when we talk about diabetes i'm gonna go ahead and start bringing that in because that's what we're going toward um this can be a little bit difficult to treat in the pre-hospital setting in the sense that some of the things that are in the blood that we need to keep a certain balance of we may not have the ability to either directly assess it or directly impact it especially in ems and an example of that would be insulin so if somebody has low blood sugar we can give them glucose, right? Uh, we can either give them oral glucose as an EMT. Paramedics can hook up an IV and push D10, D50, whatever. We can use something called glucagon, which I'll talk about later on. We can do things to up their sugar. That's, that's pretty simple. But if they're on the other side of the, of the house where their sugar is too high, or let's say it's a type one diabetic, um, we don't have the ability to play with insulin in the, in the field. Um, so if you're dealing with somebody where the problem is that, they, is that they don't have a lot of insulin, their insulin is too low, that's a hematologic emergency, but we can't do anything about that. So that is ABCs, give them oxygen, get them to the hospital as fast as you can. It's pretty much all we can do. There's gonna be a lot of things that we talk about in this module where that's all you can do. Um, it's not so much that we want to teach you 50,000 different interventions. It's that we want you to understand what you might run across and how you might be able to apply the same interventions and you'll get bored hearing O2 and transport, but that's going to be a big thing as far as what you're doing. But at the same time, you're also going to have that cognitive knowledge about, well, this is all I'm doing. Yes. But here's what my patient has, because then you can start to kind of get ahead of them with What's the hospital going to have to do? It's a type one diabetic that's got low blood sugar, uh, or I'm sorry, high blood sugar. You know that the hospital's going to have to give them insulin. So, with that in mind, you may ask different questions in your assessment. You may assess different things. It's time to start to get that information to the hospital. Be like, all right, look, you know, this patient's a type one diabetic. They took too much of their insulin. Because of that, they crashed their blood sugar. So I could give them oral glucose, but they're unconscious, so they can't take it. So I get a paramedic out there, even though your actual treatment plan may just be O2 and transport, being able to figure out what's going on can help you determine other things that will still take your patient to recovery much faster. All right, so on the anatomy, the endocrine system is a communication system that controls functions inside the body. Again, like I said, you kind of look at it like a second um, nervous system. Your nervous system, we're always taught, is the control center of the body, and it is because it directly controls the endocrine system. You kind of look at the nervous system like a slave driver with a whip. Every time it wants something done, it knows that it can't do it itself because the nervous system is either all the way on or all the way off, and we don't, we don't operate in black and white. So the nervous system is not going to directly shock the heart every time it wants the heart to pick up the pace. It's going gonna, it's gonna to beat something else and make that one do the work. Um, and that's what the endocrine system is. The endocrine system is basically the redheaded stepchild of the nervous system. Uh, the nervous system will say, I want this done, and it will just start zapping the endocrine gland that's the responsible for it until it gets the result that it wants. Endocrine glands secrete messenger hormones. So when we're talking about that, we're talking about any of those hormones that come into your body, like insulin, um, epinephrine, jeez. Uh, cortisol, there's a, bunch, there's a bunch of them that are out there. And different glands, again, they do different things. Some glands release something just to affect another gland. Like that's all it does. Um, we won't get too far into the weeds with that, but there's a, there's a bunch of different glands in your body. And each one of them, the chemicals that it releases are meant to do something different. And that's what allows us to operate in different shades of gray. Um, you know, you want to speed up, but not too far. You want to slow down, but not too much with your breathing. Those glands are responsible for that. Glucose metabolism. Do you guys remember when you went over, I, oh God, uh, EMTs don't have pathophysiology, but do y'all remember when you went over the cellular structure and how they work, what aerobic metabolism is versus anaerobic? You remember, I think that was still chapter six. It might've been seven. I'm not sure. <clears throat> it's 
a pretty good stab at it, Caesar. Um, we put it down aerobic is active. Uh, if you're thinking about it from an exercise standpoint, you're absolutely right. From a cellular standpoint, what that is, aerobic means with oxygen. All right, so if your cells are creating energy, right, they need two things. They need oxygen and glucose. The brain needs two things, oxygen and glucose. As soon as one of those things is missing or out of whack, it starts to pitch a fit. When everything is going like it should, you have what's called aerobic respiration for your cells. In other words, they are taking in oxygen and glucose and they're creating energy from it. If you take one of those away, you no longer have all the pieces to your puzzle. Um, the cells have a backup. They can do stuff without glucose for a little while. They can do stuff without oxygen for a little while, but it takes more energy to do it than what it's creating. So you're on a downward spiral at that point. Those two things go together, the glucose and the oxygen. Um, and that's what's in the cell. So when you're dealing with glucose metabolism, like it says here on the second line, insulin is necessary for glucose to enter the cells. Basically what happens is in a normal circumstances, your glucose is just floating around in your blood. Some of it gets stored in your liver, some of it gets stored in your pancreas, um, but it's just floating around. And then as your cells need it, they grab it from the bloodstream, pull it in with the oxygen. They take those, they hand them, hammer them together in the mitochondria and congratulations, you have energy. You have um, calories. So if one of those is gone, the backup system kicks in. The backup system sucks. It doesn't do a very good job. And we call that anaerobic. And that is where one of those things is missing. Usually it's oxygen. That's the first thing to go. Sometimes it's going to be um, glucose. When you're dealing with diabetic patients, that's what you're dealing with. The insulin, you can kind of look at it like the cell is a, uh, is a nightclub. All right. All the glucose wants to get in, but the door is closed. Can't do it. The only way to get in is to be escorted in or allowed in past with the bouncer, uh, which would be your insulin. So insulin shows up, connects with the glucose. It gets into the, into the blood or into the cell. If the uh, glucose is sitting there trying to get into the cell without insulin. It just hits the cell wall and bounces off. It doesn't do anything. It can't get in. So you could have um, low or high blood sugar based on how much is actually getting into the cells. And that's usually directly correlated to how much insulin is floating around in your system at the same time. Normal. Um, when things go wrong, you get into diabetes. Sometimes the insulin is a mismatch. And it's gonna, we're going again, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. All right, moving on. Um, so the pancreas produces and stores two hormones. You have glucagon and insulin. The insulin, like I said, is what actually brings the glucose into the into the cells. And glucagon actually causes the body to release glucose. So if we're if we have a lot of glucose in the body, uh, more than what the cells need, and also more than what we need floating around in the in the bloodstream, we're going to store some of it. We can store it as fat, we can store it in the liver or whatever. And then whenever we want to pull it out, let's say our blood sugar starts to drop, um, and the body is like, all right, well we need more sugar, and he hasn't, uh, you know, our our person here hasn't eaten in a while. What we'll do, what the body does is it releases glucagon in the system and that glucagon causes the liver and the pancreas to start dumping glucose back into the bloodstream so that the cells have it to work with. Um, we actually can give that as a medication at advanced levels. You guys as EMTs, you won't give glucagon, but it's good to know about it. Um, all right. So you have two different routes of getting things in and out of the pancreas or just out of the pancreas rather. So you have the actual endocrine, secu sec the endocrine secretions and you also have the owls of, of Langerhans. I cannot talk tonight. I feel like Chris is rubbing off on me. Uh, I just haven't started yawning yet. But anyway, um, the owls of Langerhans have alpha and beta cells. The alpha cells produce the glucagon. And again, if we need to pull glucose out of storage, that's what we use. The beta cells produce insulin. That takes the glucose from the bloodstream and puts it into the cells to be used. All right, so let's talk about diabetes now. 
I want to read a little bit of stats to you just because I don't have this stuff memorized. But diabetes mellitus is a disorder of glucose metabolism. So this is a problem where the glucose is not getting into the cells like it should be. And keep in mind too, not only does the glucose have to be able to get into your cells for the cells to create the, um, the energy that they need, but your body relies, the way that your body keeps track of things is by what's in the bloodstream. So the body is actually going to either dump glucagon or insulin based on how much is actually in the bloodstream. It doesn't know what's in the cells. The body has no way of tracking that. So it tracks it based on what's in your blood at any given time. If your blood glucose drops too low, that means that tells the body that the cells are eating more than what they than what's there. So glucagon gets dumped, causes more glucose to enter the bloodstream. If your blood glucose levels get high, that tells the body that you've been producing, you've either been producing too much glucose or you ate something and you got to do something with that extra sugar. So your body dumps insulin into the system to help get it into the cells. And then whatever's not being used gets put back into the uh, liver to be stored for later. Or, in, like I said, you can store it in fat cells, things of that sort. But anyway, diabetes mellitus affects about 9.3% of the population. And I think that's worldwide, because if I'm not mistaken, it is much, much higher in the U.S. population, uh, especially when you factor in type 2 diabetes. I know that our numbers, a few years back, I was... Um, doing some training to be a, a personal trainer and they were talking about diabetes in the class and it was something like 80% of people over 40 uh, have type two or are at risk of type two. It's some obscenely high number. Without treatment, blood glucose levels become too high. All right, which means what? What's missing if the glucose levels are too high? Remember, it's all a balancing game. So if your glucose is too high, what is too low? If you have a patient with too high blood sugar, do you want them to get more sugar or do you want them to get insulin, the opposite of the sugar? I need insulin. Insulin, good. Right, if, and, and now again, we can't give it, right? But it's important that you understand those processes and understand what's happening because what if you should flip that on its head? What if you showed up to somebody that had extremely, really, really stupidly low blood sugar? We know we're going to want to give them sugar, but what if it's, let's say you showed up to a house as a 56 year old diabetic patient with type 1 diabetes? Um, they have an altered mental status and it's like, 10 o'clock in the morning, um, you check their blood sugar and they don't even, it doesn't even give you a number. It just says low. What do you think might have happened? Didn't eat. Okay, good. Yeah. So they might have skipped lunch or breakfast, rather, right? But um, usually that's, that's a big part of it. But what if they what if they still took their insulin out of habit, even though they didn't eat? So they didn't get the sugar intake from their food, but they dumped all that insulin into their system. So they put what little sugar they did have got all shoved into the cells and then their blood sugar dropped. Um, so it's important to know how the body tries to balance everything. So without treatment, if you're dealing with type one diabetics, which is diabetes mellitus, um, that is where the body doesn't produce insulin like it should. It either doesn't do it enough or it may not do it at all. And so they have to give themselves insulin. They have to give themselves shots or they may be on a pump, uh, something of that sort. And that's how they get the blood sugar into their body. But they have to balance it with what they eat. If they're sick one day, especially at this time of year where they're getting colder, if they get sick, they don't eat and they're either on an automated pump that doesn't care whether they ate or not, it's just going to dump insulin, or they forget and they hit themselves with a needle, um, they could crash their blood sugar. Complications can include blindness, cardiovascular disease, and kidney failure. Um, we'll talk about the kidneys. There's something specific I want to go over about that. If we haven't already done it in another chapter, and if we have, y'all can stop me. 
But um, something I want to point out, blindness is a possibility too. You know that optometrists, not optometrists, I'm sorry, ophthalmologists um, can see, that they can basically see diabetes when they look in your eyes, when they're doing your eye exams. Um, I don't remember what it exactly was they were looking at, but something about the blood vessels at the back of the eye. If you have diabetes or you have the beginning stages of it, they can actually see um, some of the damages that are being done to those blood vessels. And it's when they are more yellow too, I think. Um, yellow eyes typically tends to be more of a problem with the liver. That's gonna be jaundice. But um, yeah, you may, be, you may still see that depending because again, you know, when your sugar gets out of whack, it may throw your liver out of whack, especially if it's long-term and then that could be causing some different things as well. Um, but an interesting thing, we actually used to have a frequent flyer, I call it that, repeat customer. Frequent flyer is kind of a bad term because you, people associate that with somebody who calls a bunch and they really don't need the help. But this one was just, she just struggled to maintain it. It really wasn't even her fault. Um, if her sugar got out of whack, one of the first things to go for her was her eyesight. And she'd be sitting at Sonic trying to get some food and then her eyesight would go. She would be perfectly aware when we would show up to take care of her. She'd hear my voice. She knew me. She, I went to school with her son and um, she'd be like, hey, Robert, how's it going? And blah, blah, blah. And I'm, you know, my sugar is bad. I can't see. And we'd give her something and it would come back. It was weird that that was one of the first signs or symptoms rather for her. But um, it, it does happen. Cardiovascular disease can be an issue. And then, like I said, kidney failure can be a problem too because your kidneys are your big balancing agent for the bloodstream. If you get too much of an electrolyte, too much sugar, too much insulin, too much potassium, any of that stuff, your body gets rid of it by making the kidneys filter it out and pee it out. Um, so if you constantly have really high blood glucose, your kidneys are working overtime all the time. Um, so the longer it goes, the more you wear your kidney. Let's see. In the vet clinic, about 5% of the patients I would see that were diabetic, they would be blind as a result of their diabetes. Are you talking about animals? I'm, I'm assuming at the vet clinic. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that was a trip for me, actually. I had a friend that had three dogs and um, one of them was a diabetic, type one diabetic. She had to give him shots. I'm like, that's that's got to be hard to manage. I mean, maybe you can speak more to that, but your dog's not going to tell you when they're not feeling right. Yeah, they're um, in the practice that I worked at, we had quite a bit of diabetic patients, cats and dogs, majority of them being dogs. But um, yeah, just and having to educate people on how to give their cat or their dog insulin every day. That's yeah, that's that's weird. I would I know I would mess it up. <laughs> Fortunate. My uh, my golden retriever is not a diabetic, um, even though, I'm, like I said, I know how the process works, but I wouldn't really know if my dog was having a fit or not. But my dog's always crazy. Um, so there's, there'd be no way to know. All right. So we break diabetes down into two different types. We have type one and type two. Type one used to be considered pediatric diabetes because typically you're born with it or you develop it early in life. That's where the pancreas is not producing insulin like it should. So your body just doesn't have that balancing agent. If you eat something, you get all this glucose, your blood sugar will skyrocket, but you don't have any insulin in your system to get it into the cells and out of the blood. Um, those types of people, manage it by giving themselves insulin shots. If they've got it for a long time, if they've gotten good at eating on a regular schedule, some people will get an insulin pump. And if you're responding to an insulin pump issue, a lot of times the pump is the problem. Um, you don't have to be an expert on insulin pumps because I guarantee you the person wearing it is. So as long as they're conscious to talk to you, uh, you can let them kind of step you around how that pump works. If you have to take them to the hospital for a pump issue, bring everything with it. Bring the charger, bring batteries, extra batteries if they've got them, however it's powered. Um, don't just take them in, their, in the pump with nothing else. So bring everything that goes with it. Type two, 
is the other type of diabetes. Type two is what people get, and it's usually a lifestyle choice. Um, a lot of times it's tied to obesity and just bad dieting, but there's other reasons than that. So, you know, people get type two um, for things that are sometimes beyond their control. They just develop it later on. And usually it is for, di um, for obesity or just bad, bad food decisions for a long time. But type two is where the body's making the insulin just fine. So body's making the insulin just fine, right? It's getting into the bloodstream. The glucose is in the bloodstream. The body creates it, trying insulin, trying to bring the, the blood sugar levels down. Um, but for whatever reason, the, it's like the it's like the nightclub fired the bouncer. So the bouncer and the and the person are trying to get in, but they can't they can't get into the cell, even though the insulin is there. So it's insulin resistance. All right, that's your two main differences. There's a third type. We really don't harp on it too much, but it's basically just pregnancy induced. Um, Pregnancy induced gestational diabetes is a separate type of diabetes. It really kind of mirrors type two. Um, but because it's temporary, it only it goes away after the pregnancy is over. They don't lump it in. It's it's its own little own little section. All right. So for type one, like I said, your treatment is going to typically be insulin injections um, because the body's got to get it from somewhere. And if it's not creating it on its own, then the patient has to inject themselves and they have to be good enough to time it right with their food. They have to get the right amount of it with their food. And sometimes, especially if they're either sick, elderly, um, scatterbrained, you know, maybe they went drinking or something because you'll find there are a lot of people who may be diabetic just because they're diabetic doesn't mean they're not going to get drunk with their friends. Um, that kind of thing. They may make mistakes and either give themselves too much insulin and cr crash themselves out, or they will not give themselves enough and they'll get hyperglycemic. All right. If it's administered great, correct. Or if, or if it's administered correctly, then fantastic. All right. If not, well, then we have problems. And the issue with type one diabetics is, is that if they're high, we really can't do anything for that because the answer is more insulin. Um, the hospital has to do that. If they're low, though, that's our wheelhouse. We can give it to them. If you don't know, err on the side of it being low and give it to them. Let's say you showed up to a patient and you went to get their blood glucose, but for whatever reason, your your glucometer broke. Uh, or, you know, shame on you if it happens, but you forgot to check it that day and you didn't realize you didn't have any lancets left or something of that sort. Uh, if you can't get a reading, then give the give the glucose because hyperglycemia comes on much slower. The issues take longer to take effect, and typically you'll have them at a hospital or somewhere where they can actually get a reading and then give insulin if they need to to counter counteract what you did. On the flip side, if they're hypoglycemic, those that's a much faster onset. They're going to lose their consciousness much faster. They're going to get combative much faster because they're getting altered mental status. Um, they're going to slip into a coma faster, you know, all that stuff. So it's better to give the sugar when it's not needed than it is to withhold the sugar when you probably should have given it. All right, let's see. I think we already talked about everything that's on this slide, patients who inject. Insulin often need to check blood glucose levels sometimes up to six times a day. I remember when there was a commercial that started coming out. I forget what the uh, product was, but the old guy that they had doing that commercial was like, and the best part is we don't have to prick our fingers anymore. Um, and I used to laugh at that because at the time I didn't know. I didn't know like, how often, like literally how often they had to prick themselves. If you're only pricking yourself once a day, or once every few days, or like, you know, I don't have diabetes. So the only time I ever get my finger pricked is when I go to do my uh, my firefighter physical. So I kind of laughed at that. I thought that was funny. And and it then I realized exactly how often type one diabetics need to prick themselves. And I stopped laughing because that's, I wouldn't, I don't know if I could do that. Pricking myself before and after every single thing I eat would be misery. Um, like I said, you will find some type one diabetics with an in implanted insulin pump 
Uh, usually, if that's what they've got, the problem isn't the insulin. The problem is either they didn't eat or the pump is going bad. Uh, if that's the case, like I said, take all accessories to, of their pump, take it with you to the hospital. If it winds up being that they forgot to eat something, then you can treat it like a normal diabetic. You can give them some glucose if they're conscious, get them to eat something and start counteracting that insulin. Because what's happening is, is the pump doesn't know they didn't eat. The pump's just putting the insulin in the system. You get too much insulin, it starts taking the bloodstream or taking the glucose out of the blood, right? That balance gets out of whack. And this is anything with the endocrine system is all about balance. Everything about it. When I'm even so you can take that beyond diabetes. Uh, you can go to pretty much any endocrine issue, and it's all about balance. If you if you get good at knowing what hormones come from what um, glands, and how you know what their opposing hormones are, um, you will be a freaking wizard at this because a lot of people don't. They don't. They know the big ones. They know diabetes, and that's about it. And that's a shame. Um, that's just that's all we teach you in school. Okay. Find my place here. There we go. All right. Type 1 diabetes is the most common metabolic disease of childhood. Again, they used to call it pediatric uh, diabetes for that reason. No, oh, wait a minute. Have you seen the huge trial of criminal fraud on the lady that developed a machine for blood testing that was a hoax? No. Uh, unmute. Tell me about that. What, what was going on with that? So uh, I think I could find her name. I can't remember it right now, but a little while ago, a lady had developed this machine that apparently was going to replace phlebotomist completely in which it was a machine you could bring into a room, prick a finger, and then analyze everything right there and then. Only problem was it's kind of like the new thing that's going on with this hydrogen truck that is also a criminal fraud case that they said they developed it and everything and had like test trials, but it turned out it was all fake. And that's the case that's going on right now. Wow. No, I hadn't heard about that. Now, I'm, I love tech. Don't get me wrong. I mean, if you could see all the, the I, I'm talking to y'all on my iPad or I'm sorry, on, my, on my MacBook, but my iPad is sitting next to me. I've got two iPhones, an Apple Watch. I love tech and I love when technology says that they can do things, but I'm also uh, pretty skeptical when it comes to stuff like that. Because, for example, if my, if my iPhone or, or rather my Apple Watch tries to tell me that it can check my blood sugar just by being on my wrist, I'm not really going to believe that until I know how that happens. Like, how's it going to do that? Right. Um, I know I did see the one thing that I thought was pretty cool. It was a, um, but I think it, I, so I think that's got to, got to hurt too when you move, but there's this new way of doing it where you don't prick yourself all the time. It's one needle stays in you all the time. And it's got a little port thing at the, at the skin level that you touch and it reads it, gives you a reading right then and there instead of pricking yourself six times a day but i can't imagine i think it's it goes on your arm and um i can't imagine moving your arm around with the needle in your arm all day long that's gotta hurt i would think but i mean it probably is uh probably less painful than stabbing yourself in the finger six times a day I mean, that'd be my guess but that one i've seen i hadn't i hadn't seen the thing about the the machine to replace phlebotomists. That's that's interesting. If you can find, is that the name Elizabeth Ann Holmes? That's it. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to Google that later on. I hadn't heard about it. There's I think a documentary on Hulu or something about it too, because she'd gone all the way to Silicon Valley and was up there with Microsoft and everybody. Oh wow. So and this is a criminal suit, so she knew it was fake. She knew she was marketing something that wasn't working so they had been like in the development stages for about eight years mm -hmm. and she never gave a final product so she kind of just went away with all the money from the investors oh okay all right that's that's a different uh that's better than trying to pull the wool over your patient's eyes i guess you know it sucks you took the money and ran um 
but at least at least you didn't try to put that out there and have you know grandparents buying it thinking that there was going to be the next best thing since sliced bread and just taking their money so new onset patient was will have symptoms related to eating and drinking you say you're going to have polyuria polydipsia polyphagia weight loss fatigue basically you're either going to you're going to want to eat all the time um especially if your insulin is high because it's going to bring your blood sugar down that usually tells you it triggers your your want to eat uh if your sugar is high on the opposite end of it you're going to wind up having to go to the bathroom a lot and your urine is going to smell really sweet because your kidneys again like i said your kidneys are filters so you're not just getting rid of the water you drink right we're not just when we, when we go to the bathroom, we're not just getting rid of excess fluid. We're getting rid of those fluids because those fluids are the vehicle to get rid of the excess electrolytes and the excess sugar and stuff like that. That's why we're going to the bathroom. Um, you should just be drinking enough that the water you lose is still clear. But that's another topic for another day. Um, but if you have diabetes, if your sugar is really high, your, your kidneys are working overtime trying to keep your blood sugar down. Because again, it's the, that whole balance thing is the name of the game for the endocrine system. Um, and if you're exceptionally high in your sugar, then your urine is going to be dark. It's going to kind of smell. Um, it's going to smell sweet. It may look like sweet tea. It may smell like sweet tea, that kind of thing. Eventually, you may lose weight. Um, if your sugar's high, you're not going to really be storing those extra glucose in your fat cells. So you're going to lose fat. Sounds great, but that's an unhealthy way to lose weight. That's not the kind of weight loss you want. That's like coffee and cocaine diet. It's just not, it's not the best way to do it. When a patient's blood glucose level is above normal, the kidneys filters, it's almost like I just said that. So that's where your polyuria polydipsia and your uh, polyphagia come in. When the glucose is low, the body turns to burning fat. Um, anybody here do the keto diet? No. No? Nope. Nobody's doing, not one person is doing the keto diet. How many people do we have in class? Nine people, well, eight, because I'm counting. I'm counted in that number. Uh, it's, usually, I've got at least one person that does keto. Yeah, <laughs> I'm right there with you, Bailey. I would do keto, but I like pizza too much. Um, that's just like I would, I would be a vegetarian, but you know, there's steaks and uh, ham, and it's just not gonna, it's just not gonna work out. Um, I have done keto in the past. I will probably get back on it in the future. That's keto itself is not bad, but what's happening? is you're cutting out all your carbs, right? So um, if you're cutting out where you're getting all your carbs from, your body's not, that's what we draw our glucose from. We turn carbs into sugar. Um, so if you're not getting any carbs or you're not getting enough, like if you're doing keto, it's not necessarily that you're not eating any carbs, you're just keeping it below a certain amount. You're making it to where your body can't draw enough sugar, enough glucose to, um, to keep everything going, to keep all the lights on in the, in the body. So what it does is, is it flips over and it starts trying to draw from fat. Um, if, you, if anybody's taking a nutrition class, you get so many calories from each of your macronutrients. You get, I think it's, I think it's six from proteins, six from carbs and nine from fat. So you get more calories, you get more energy from burning fat than you do from burning carbs but you burn carbs much easier. That's the thing. It takes a lot to burn and break apart fat cells. So our body doesn't like doing that. That's why we defer to carbs. They're easier. You, you can eat more of them to get the same amount of energy. So you kind of get full better. Um, but we are able to eat whatever we want. We're not just herbivores. We're not just meat eaters. Um, and because of that, we can change things. We, you can do keto if you want to. Just, I mean, as long as you're eating, it's better than starving yourself or something of those lines. Um, keto works. I've noticed that people that do keto, they lose their weight, but when they come off of keto, they gain it all back. Um, so that's kind, of, that's kind of the issue that I've seen with it. But anyway, what you're doing there is you're causing the body to say, all right, there's not enough carbs to draw glucose from. So 
I don't have the easy route. I'm going to take the next easiest, which is burning fat. Um, and that's basically what's happening here, like it says on the slide. So if that happens, um, it starts to produce acid waste, which is called ketones, and you pee it out. That's why if you've ever done the keto diet, you have those pee strips and everybody you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm in ketosis. So you pee on that strip and it's basically checking for ketones. If it sees it in the blood or not in the blood, I'm sorry, if it sees it in your urine, that tells you that your body is now taking its energy from your fat cells rather than carbs. So yes, you're in ketosis. And if you're going to ride that line, do it at your own risk, but um, you will lose fat because that's where you're drawing your energy from. There's been people that have done it long term i can't i like like bailey i love my carbs too much um but anyway as the ketone levels go up in the blood they spill into the urine that's how you can detect it on those urine strips kidneys can't maintain acid base balance if this is done against your will that's the thing so diabetes for example we don't just oh, i'm gonna i'm gonna turn my diabetes on today it's it doesn't work that way so we're talking about a long-term thing you're not going to come out of this. This is something that's happening because you just, for the entirety of your life or however long you've had this, you've been in this, this backwards balance. Um, your kidneys have to work overtime to get those ketones out of your blood. Just like if you were only, if you had hyperglycemia, it'd be working overtime to get the glucose out. And so it can long-term, it can lead to some kidney problems. Um, with that, you also get that higher acid base. So if the patient's pH balance gets acidic, what does that do with their breathing? It messes with their breathing, right? It, it, it does. It, yeah, it yeah, says it, it increases. It increases. Why, why does it increase? What are we doing when we pick up our breathing rate? something that we shouldn't be doing far as let's say you're mowing the yard and as you mow in the yard you know that your your body is just your blood is just flushing on it it's hot outside you can't catch your breath something like that all right think about it from the ph balance if our ph becomes acidic so we get the normal ph of the body is 7.35 to 7.45 so 7.4 is perfectly right in the middle of where we want to be we have that 0.05 range either below or, or above if we get acidic if our bloodstream and our and our body as a whole becomes acidic we start breathing faster what are we doing if you if you take a breath what are you breathing in what are you breathing out so you're breathing in oxygen right. you're expelling carbon dioxide Correct. So what I want you guys to think about here, anytime you're dealing with a metabolic issue like this, your breathing itself becomes a buffer to maintain your pH balance. So if you breathe out carbon dioxide, anything that has "-ide", in the name, like dioxide, that's an acid. So what we're doing is, is we're off-gassing acid, all right? We're, we're lowering our pH balance, or Sorry, we're raising our pH balance to, um, to maintain that homeostasis, that 7.35 to 7.45. We don't want to get too acidic. So if our, if our body sensors start to say, hey, our acid is starting to build up here, we need to get rid of it. The body, the easiest and fastest way for that to happen is the body is just going to pick up your breathing rate. It'll do other things, but they take longer, right? So that buffer, that's why we don't breathe the same speed all day long. Our breathing rate will fluctuate even if we don't get out of the recliner, your breathing rate will fluctuate. So, because what's happening is, is that your body is breathing either faster or slower to maintain that acid-base balance. So if you've got ketones building up in the blood, ketones are acidic. And what that means that your kidneys are gonna work over time to try to get that acid out of you. You're gonna start to breathe faster, all right? If it can't get fixed, if those things don't do it, we start to get into what's called diabetic ketoacidosis basically saying that due to diabetes, we have acid acidosis based on the ketones that are in our blood because our body is breaking down fat to draw our energy from. So that's where that name comes from. Diabetics, get it? Diabetic ketoacidosis, all right? Um, 
if it gets really bad, then you start to get into some of these issues like too small respirations, um, some serious altered mental status. Um, it can start to mimic head injuries, that kind of thing. So just be aware that a lot of times we try to get our patients back to that balance, but um, sometimes it's a race against the clock to get them to the hospital because if the problem is fixed with insulin and we don't have that ability, they may be going this DKA route, diabetic ketoacidosis, and we can't do anything about it. So time's not on your side. They need plenty of diesel, get them to the hospital so that the hospital can put them on a machine that monitors their insulin right, and then they can actually titrate the right amounts to get them back where they need to be. All right, so um, if somebody does develop diabetic ketoacidosis, which is basically just, think of it like a diabetic emergency getting into the extremes. And there's a step past DKA as well, but um, we're, we're, not, we're not there yet. So what you're gonna see, your patient may tell you that they have abdominal pain, body aches, nausea, vomiting, and altered mental status or unconsciousness. So the nausea and the vomiting is another way the body is trying to get rid of extra stuff, not to mention um, when the diabetic, when the diabetes gets out of hand like that, those cells aren't able to function properly, right? Because they're missing something. They're either not getting enough oxygen or they're not getting enough glucose or something of that sort, um, or the pH is getting too bad. And the pH balance, if it gets too far out of whack, it'll start killing off the cells. Well, if your GI tract cells are the ones that are starting to die off, it's going to give you nausea and vomiting. Um, when your hormones get out of whack like that, it causes the altered mental status. Again, the brain is the biggest baby in the body. Everything needs oxygen and glucose to survive, but the minute one of those gets at least a little bit out of whack, your brain's going to be the first thing to flip out. So if somebody is hypoxic, um, what do you think is the first thing you're going to see in a patient that's hypoxic? Do you think you're going to see cyanosis, which is blue around the lips? Or do you think you're going to see increased rate of breathing and an increased um, anxiety? You're going to go with the increase of anxiety. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Has anybody ever tried to take a breath and found out they couldn't do it? Any of you firefighters ever accidentally lay down on your air hose when you're, when you're wearing your pack? You try to take a breath and that mask just sucks to your face. Um, and suddenly you just freak like there's even if you 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 could be really really good at keeping your wits about you but the minute you try to take a breath and you can't do it you're gonna freak you you can probably still get through it you'll calm yourself down but for that split second you freak out um think about patients that you may see if somebody has copd or emphysema and they have a breathing issue they are not just kind of sitting there relaxed and saying, hey, I need some oxygen. They're usually freaking out. They're tripoding and hyperventilating. And they got this look like somebody's got a gun pointed at them and they're coming after you because they know that you've got the oxygen cylinder and they want it. Um, that's basically your first sign. So the brain's going to be the first thing to mess up. And that's where that altered mental status comes in. So if you think about your diabetic patients, like your hypoglycemic patients, that's why they always have those altered level of consciousness um, issues. You're going to get them in altered mental status. And that is also why every single time we check on a patient, if they're not right in the head, if something's wrong, if they're um, falling asleep on you, if they're confused, any of that sort of thing, we're going to check a blood sugar. You're going to get that when you get your vitals, because that may be what's causing the issue. All right, we're going to finish this slide and then we're going to take a break. So if it's not recognized and treated, DKA can result in death. Um, I have thankfully have not seen anybody die of a diabetic emergency in the EMS system. Um, usually it's kind of like a stroke in that they didn't take advantage of it at home. They went in out of consciousness. Nobody was there to call 911 and it just progressed until it killed them. Uh, it's tragic when that happens. But sometimes that can happen. If, if somebody lives home alone, if they go out, who's, who's going to call 911? So um, this can result in death if it's not taken care of. So 
just keep that in mind. You may go to somebody. That's why it's always good when you guys get your national registry cert, you go to work for an ambulance. If you've got a frequent flyer in your area that's a known diabetic, um, it may not hurt to start making daily trips out there on your time instead of waiting for them to call you all the time. Go out every morning. If they, Like what I used to do, I get to work at seven, check off my truck. And unless they toned us out for a call right then and there, my partner and I would go ahead and go to the, um, the lady down the street that has diabetes. She lives by herself. We would go every morning and check on her. Just, hey, how's it going? Make sure you ate breakfast, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and it did a couple of things. One, it helped set the routine for her so that she stayed on her eating and, and everything like it should be. She didn't feel the need to call us all the time when she was um, wanting to do it, which may or may not have been a good time for us, especially if we had another call. Um, it helped teach her how to handle her diabetes, even though she really never did a good job of it. And um, it was just really good community relations. And she made it, she eventually passed away, but it, she made it a lot further than I think she would have if we just reacted to her 911 calls and that was the only time we ever saw her. But uh, anyway, just so you know, if you're getting glucose on somebody with DKA, a lot of times it's gonna be really high. Um, if somebody has a blood, a blood glucose over 400, Typically, they are going to be in DKA. Um, it's the best way for you to know. And again, with that, you're going to find them hyperventilating. You may see their blood pressure really high. Um, we had one that I couldn't get a manual blood pressure. His systolic was off the top of the, uh, the gauge. We had to use a monitor. I didn't have a choice. So sometimes you're going to deal with that. All right, take a break. Take 10 minutes. Uh, be back at 7.10 and we'll get started with type 2.
All right, so let's go ahead and get back on it. Uh, name of the documentary is The Inventor Out for Blood in Silicon Valley. All right. Um, did you say if that was on Hulu or what was, what's the final verdict on where that's actually at? Assuming you're back. Okay, anyway, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, so we're gonna pick up with type two and I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit. So if you guys have questions, don't hesitate to stop me because I don't wanna leave anybody in the dust or anything like that. I know that um, diabetes, when it comes to what to do, it's pretty easy, uh, but it can get kind of confusing when we're talking about the physiology of things. But anyway, so recapping type one, type one, they used to call it pediatrics because we were either born with it or you developed it really early in life. It's where the body stopped producing insulin. So no insulin production at all in the body. Or if there is, it's so negligible that it really doesn't matter. Type two, type two is usually the result of other things in our lives that we either, we usually can control it. There's definitely a link between obesity and type two diabetes, for example. Um, this is caused by resistance to the insulin. So the insulin's there, right? Your pancreas is working. Everything's going fine. You've got blood glucose in your, or you got glucose in your blood ready to go to the into the cells. You've got insulin in your blood ready to take the glucose to the cells, but something's not happening. The cells are saying, nope, sorry, you can't enter here. None shall pass, that kind of thing. Um, like I said, there's an association between obesity and increased resistance to the effects of insulin. Um, and it can change, you know, at any given time, you may be taking your glucose in just fine. The insulin is working fine. And then you start to get that resistance for a while. And that causes you to go into hypoglycemia and then you get past it and your insulin starts to work again and then and everything. So it's not always a steady thing. Um, the pancreas produces more insulin to make up for the increased levels of blood glucose and dysfunction of cellular insulin receptors, more insulin in the blood means that when those cells do finally kick in and open up the doors, all that glucose is going to flood in because it's extra insulin. And so you wind up with these quick spur of the moment, don't know why you got it, hypoglycemic attacks. You may be sitting there watching Jeopardy and then suddenly just be unconscious or walking through the grocery store. I actually had this, I mentioned it in the Facebook group earlier. Uh, walking through the grocery store, feel it come on, grab the nearest chocolate bar to try to help keep your sugar up. Uh, and then wake up later on sitting in the produce, literally with your pants down and chocolate all over your face because you couldn't aim properly to get the chocolate bar in your mouth. Um, it sucks when things like that happen because they come out of nowhere, you're not planning on it and it can be dangerous. There's, I've been hit from behind in a car wreck before because the driver behind me had a hypoglycemic attack while driving down the road. Um, Thankfully, we were coming to a stop already anyway, so he didn't slam into me too hard. But, I mean, it, it just, you never know when it's going to happen. Um, the good thing about type 2, though, is if it comes on by something that we've caused, a lot of times it'll go away by something that we cause. So people that are habitually obese, um, you know, long-term problems in that area, they get hypo, uh, type 2 diabetes, and then they make a change for the better. Um, as they start to lose weight, they may kick their diabetes altogether. They may get it to where it's manageable by normal means, say they still have that insulin resistance, but it's not as resistant. So they may be able to come off their meds, even though they still have the type two diabetes. Metformin, if anybody has ever taken that or heard of somebody taking that, is a nasty, nasty drug. Um, I don't know anybody who takes metformin and likes it or has no problem with it. It makes them nauseous. It makes them have to go to the bathroom all the time and not the fun trips. Um, it's just a horrible, horrible, like it takes a toll, um, but it's necessary for their, for their diabetes. Um, okay, so yeah, how is that for you? Especially when you, something like gestational where you took it long enough to get adapted to it and then you came off of it. Yeah, it tasted disgusting. It definitely had side effects with your gut. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why I kind of feel bad that you had that um, 
for gestational because that means you got to go through all the fun of adapting to it, which is when it's at its worst. And then you got done with your pregnancy, kicked off the, the gestational diabetes and didn't need the med anymore. So, I mean, good, you don't need the med, but you got to ride the worst part of it for, no, for without, without ever having to worry about or whatever, having to look forward to being past that. But anyway, um, metformin is the typical prescribed medication for diabetes, uh, particularly type two diabetics. Insulin is what type one uses and metformin is taken as a pill. All right. So if you're responding to somebody and we'll get into the assessment of this in a little while, when you get to that medications part, keep an ear out for that med. If you hear metformin, there's a couple of different things that people take it for. Diabetes is one of them. Uh, if it's a female, um, PCOS, if you all have ever heard of that, polycystic ovarian syndrome, they will take metformin for that. Um, there's a couple other things out there, but it's very much and very commonly used for diabetes. So you're going to hear it a lot when you're dealing with type two diabetics, if they tell you that they're on it, you know, maybe don't assume, but you can pretty well start going down that road, especially if they're having um, altered mental status, right? If you're dealing with altered mental status and the, the spouse says, well, they take metformin. Okay, well, this is probably a diabetic issue. So whew, injectable medications and, and, and insulin are also used for type two diabetes. Um, Again, it's not normal, but sometimes you may see that depends. Having more insulin in the system can over can counteract that resistance that's there. It may only be resisting 20% of the insulin, but the body's not realizing that, or they've been in it for so long that they're starting to wear out the uh, pancreas and everything because it's again, just like the kidneys, it's been redlining, trying to do more and more for so long. Um, Type two is often diagnosed at a yearly medical exam because that's when we find it. We're not really, you don't just wake up one day and go, oh, I got a headache. I think I got type two diabetes. It usually gets found out when you're doing your blood work, um, going to your annual physical. So if you live in an area where you've got a lot of people, a lot of it, like the South, for example, um, I hate to say it this way, but yeah, right where most of y'all are. I'm from down there, I, I understand. You have a lot of people who either don't have insurance or they just don't, they don't value going to get a, a annual physical or getting checked up. They'll go to the doctor when they feel like they're dying and that's about it. Um, but they don't get a normal checkup. And even us in the fire department, you know, NFPA 1500 says we're supposed to do a firefighter physical every year. A lot of departments don't do that because it costs money and it's a lot of money. And um, so they'll skip it. Right. So you might go five years with type two diabetes and have no idea that you've got it, especially if you or, you know, I say you, but like if your community has got a lot of overweight people in it um, and that's the, the culture of the community, they're not real health conscious or whatever they you may have a lot of patients in your area that have type two diabetes and they have no idea that they've got it. Um, but anyway. You usually pick it up in medical exams, and it usually comes from complaints related to high blood glucose levels, including recurrent infection. They're always getting sick. Uh, remember, we talked about vision earlier. So if your vision has been going bad and it doesn't, it, it had like you were fine and then it took a turn for the worse, or sometimes you just have a hard time focusing on something and then suddenly you can see again and it goes away and comes back. Uh, and numbness in the feet. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a second when we start talking about the extremities. So symptoms of hyperglycemia. Um, this is where the blood sugar is high and it's actually causing a problem, right? So again, just like all of your vitals, we, we always use the term treat your patient, not your monitor. In other words, just because somebody's got a high heart rate doesn't mean that they need to have something to bring that heart rate down or vice versa. Uh, just because somebody's got high blood uh, glucose doesn't mean we need to drag it back down. That might be normal for them. All right. So we have, you have what your topic is, like hyperglycemia, for example. They can either be symptomatic or asymptomatic. Asymptomatic means, yeah, the blood sugar is high, but there's nothing wrong with this person. They're perfectly uh, healthy. They're alert. They're oriented. 
They're not having any issues. They have no complaints. They just have high blood glucose. That's normal. That's normal for them. All right. But if you do actually see the symptoms, um, this is kind of what we, this is where we come in. This is where we worry about it. So this occurs when the blood glucose levels are high. Again, that's hyper, right? So hyperglycemia. And the patient is going to start to have some symptoms. So altered mental status is usually the first thing to come up because the brain's the biggest baby in the body. In type 1 diabetes, this leads to ketoacidosis, which we talked about earlier. All right. Now, ketoacidosis and non-ketotic hyperosmolar state, which we're going to talk about here in a second, um, they all lead to, ur to increased urination, which leads to dehydration, right? Because again, your sugar is getting high. Everything is done in the name of balance. So your kidneys are going to start throwing all the fluid out of your body, trying to drag the glucose with it, and we're going to dehydrate. So they're going to keep going to the bathroom over and over. Their urine is going to smell sweet. So they like sweet tea, like you're peeing out sweet tea. That's what's happening when you get to these levels. And so a lot of your symptoms that you're going to notice, you're going to have the ultra level of consciousness, but you're also going to kind of mimic dehydration. There's going to be a lot of stuff because that's what you've got. Um, it's, it's all pointing down the dehydration route, but it's why are they dehydrated? That's where you kind of want to get that idea. And so you would check their blood sugar. And in this case, it's going to be really, really high. Um, the difference between these two, why they call them different things, ketoacidosis and type 1, is because the body is keeping a lot of ketones in the blood. By name, as you can see it, in type 2, that's not the case. Type 2, the sugar is there, right? You haven't resorted to breaking down ketones, but the sugar is high. So you're getting the same problem. It's just not being caused by those fat ketones. That's the difference between type one and type two when it comes to the hyperglycemia aspect. If an individual has hyperglycemia for a protected or a long period of time, the consequences of diabetes can be pretty bad um, and they can be long-term. So wounds that don't heal, right? Numbness in the hands and feet. So if you've ever had a family member or you knew somebody who had diabetes and they didn't take care of it. What, what typically happens to their feet and their hands? They get neuropathy. Right. Yep. So you get neuropathy in there. And what usually happens if they don't take care of it? What does the hospital do? Amputation. Amputation. Do you know why? What are, they, what are they trying to stop from happening? Or stop from getting worse, rather? So let me, let me, let me, let me frame it differently. If you've got a patient with a, um, a neuropathy in their foot, right? And so now you're not getting electrical impulses down there like you should. They're going to get numb. They're going to hurt themselves. Their wounds aren't going to heal. Um, they may have problems with blood flow getting down there for that, for the neuropathy reasons can cause some blood flow issues. And these issues don't fix themselves. They can absolutely, it will spread infection. So the problem is, is that when those injuries happen and they don't get any better, the cells die. If the blood flow is bad, the cells can die. Uh, if the neuropathy is bad, the cells can die. And when cells die, that causes necrosis. All right. Necrotic tissue is, is like zombies. If, when a necrotic tissue comes in contact with a living tissue, it kills the living tissue. Um, the, so the necrosis will spread. It spreads like an infection, even though it's not an outside issue. It's your own death, basically, at a cellular level that's spreading. So in these cases with diabetics, what's happening is, is that their, their cells have turned necrotic, usually down in the extremities. And the only way to stop it is to cut it off. And so that's why we wind up having to amputate hands and feet, particularly feet, um, when patients don't take care of this stuff. We're trying to stop the spread of necrosis because if that stuff gets into your internal organs, like your heart and lungs, it, it will kill you. That'll be it. And we don't want that. It's better to lose a foot and get another 10, 15, 20 years out of life than to go a couple of months and then die from necrosis. All right, blindness we already talked about. Renal failure, again, if the kidneys are redlining, trying to flush everything out long-term, they're going to wear themselves out. Um, and then gastric motility problems can be an issue as well. 
So when blood glucose levels are not controlled in diabetes mellitus type two, HHNS or a hyper, what is it called? It's um, hyperosmolar, hy something non-ketotic syndrome. I uh, was really hoping that they would have had that on the slide. But um, this is basically the type two version of ketoacidosis. Remember, ketoacidosis is type one, HHNS is type two. Uh, key signs and symptoms are going to be pretty close together. So you're going to have your hyperglycemia, blood sugar is high, your altered mental status, drowsiness, lethargy. You're going to have the severe dehydration. So your thirst and dark urine, because your kidneys are still doing the same thing. They're just doing it for different reasons. Visual or sensory deficits, partial paralysis or muscle weakness and seizures. Um, usually all, a lot of these are caused by the dehydration aspect. Uh, oh, and you, you, you may find patients that try to do it, but they're not, they're, they'll fail. It's not possible to drink enough water to compensate for that. The dehydration is going to happen. They're usually you're going to wind up being put on an IV and they're going to have fluid given by the bag because they're that dehydrated. Uh, so they need to either go to a hospital or if you're a basic truck, you need to call out a, if this is what you're dealing with, they're beyond just getting some glucose or, or anything of that sort. They need lots of fluid. Uh, call a paramedic, something of that sort. Or if you're close to a hospital, just go ahead and take them. High glucose levels in the blood can cause excretion of glucose in the urine. All right, right? Because again, we're trying to keep that balance. We'll beat that dead horse to death all night long because you're going to see stuff on the registry that pertains to that. All right. Now let's look at the flip side of it. Hypoglycemia. Symptomatic hypoglycemia. Um, these come on fast. The problem is hyperglycemia is a slow onset. We talked about that. That's why like, if you're in doubt, whether or not, if you think they're high or low, just treat it like they're low, give them sugar. It's okay. The problems that you'll give from giving too much sugar are going to take longer to take effect. And they should be at the hospital by then. The problems that come up from hypoglycemia though, they come on fast, usually in a matter of seconds. So when we say minutes count, we mean it because if they in 20 seconds can go from being fine to being combative and half unconscious, imagine what's gonna happen after just two or three minutes. Acute emergency in which a patient's blood glucose is too low. Um, and this can occur in patients who either if they're type one diabetics, they may inject too much insulin um, or they may take something that causes the body to produce too much insulin, that kind of thing, especially if they're type, if they're type one, they probably gave it to themselves. If they're type two, um, something like the metformin or, or um, some other medication has caused their pancreas to go into overdrive and it drains their blood glucose down too low. <clears throat> when the insulin levels remain high, the glucose rapidly gets taken out of the blood. And so you're gonna get that number on your glucometer is gonna be too low. Well, let me ask you this, because I know we've been over vital signs. What's the range for glucose? What's the range for blood sugar that we want to see? 80 to 120. 80 to 120. That's a good one. I like that. Um, how low is too low? Like below 60. Yeah. Yeah, I would say anything below 60. Uh, I think the textbook agrees on that number. I know that vital signs can change from one publisher to the other, but I'm pretty sure 60 is pretty standard for uh, glucose. So yeah, uh, look at it like your heart rate, right? The bottom level of heart rate for an adult is 60. Anything less than 60 is a problem. Anything less than 60, glucose is a problem. When insulin levels remain high, I said that. All right, if glucose levels fall, there may be an insufficient amount to supply the brain, and then you're going to get that altered level of consciousness. Mental status of the patient will decline pretty rapidly. Um, and remember, mental status, they're going to start off getting confused, right? So they may forget where they are or when they are. They may forget their name or they will, they may forget who their significant other is. They may forget what they were doing. You walk into a room and have a senior moment, uh, but that senior moment doesn't go away, that kind of thing. You're going to see that first. And then when their actual level of consciousness starts to, to crash out, then they're going to go from just being confused to now they're starting to fall asleep on you. And that's when they're dangerous. Because um, the nicest lady you've ever met 
will get combative and start fighting if she slips into that little twilight zone of her uh, level of consciousness and doesn't know who you are anymore and can't see you and thinks you might be attacking her that fight or flight response kicks in and that is pure reflex that's not you know grandma susie down the street that um, gets walked across the street by the boy scouts that's some that's a human brain saying hey something's wrong and i don't know what's going on around me so instincts kick in um so you got to be careful about that all right be aware that your patients may be combative don't don't let the fact that you know the person especially if it's family members or something like that they may never hurt a fly they would never raise a hand to you but that's the alert them that would never do that all right patient may become aggressive or display unusual behavior i think i just beat that to death enough common reasons for a low blood glucose level so let's say that they took too much insulin or um they took the right amount of insulin, but they skipped a meal, right? Um, correct dose of insulin without the patient eating a sufficient amount, correct dose of insulin and the patient develops an acute illness. So <clears throat> let's say they took their insulin and then they got the flu. That can do it. Um, if they got COVID, if they got, I don't know, um, gonocephaloperlates probably. Any, anything that would cause the body to react in, a, in an immune response can trigger this stuff, um, especially when the body starts trying to utilize more of the fluid that it's got, right? So your body's already, your kidneys are using fluid to try to um, flush out glucose, but in your body's immune response, fluid shifting, glucose shifting, stuff like that may cause an imbalance and so you've indirectly caused a uh, or not you but your body has accidentally caused a diabetic emergency we already talked about this hypoglycemia develops much more quickly than hyper <clears throat> signs and symptoms uh these are what you normally see when you talk about diabetic emergencies the emergency aspect is typically going to be hypoglycemia so these should look familiar. Normal to shallow or resp uh, rapid respirations, right? Because again, they're trying to blow off the acidity. Pale, moist skin, diaphoresis. What is diaphoresis? Sweating. Sweating, good. And not just a little glisten. Diaphoresis is typically, it looks like you ran a marathon in 100 degree weather. You were pouring. Um, dizziness and a headache, rapid pulse, normal to low blood pressure. What is that? If you look at all of that, what does that sound like to y'all? What's another term that we always try to watch out for that would have these um, signs and symptoms? Are you at crisis or shock? You're kind of warm. There you go. Shock. All right, so yeah, if you normal to shallow or rapid respirations, you typically see that in decompensated shock. Pale, moist skin, right? Because blood flow has been shunted to the internal organs. So you'll see that in shock. Diaphoresis, you can see in shock. You'll see that in cardiac compromise as well. But as a whole, I wanted y'all to like look at that. Dizziness and a headache. <clears throat> uh, usually your patient's unconscious, so you wouldn't get that information from them. But rapid pulse with a normal to low blood pressure. That why does that happen? If the if you see those two things together in vital science, or their pulse is high but their blood pressure is not, why do you think that's why do you think that's the case? Any ideas? This is a little bit of a tangent, but I want you guys to think about this when you're looking at your vital signs, because I don't want y'all to, I don't want y'all to come out of school thinking of your vital signs as just a set of numbers, um, which is what unfortunately a lot of, a lot of people do, even in the field, they'll, I don't know what these vital signs mean. I just got the numbers. I'll give them the paramedic. He knows what they mean. Um, so your pulse, the pulse rate 
is, is serving two purposes. One is getting the right amount of oxygen around the body as it needs to, right? So if you need more oxygen, your pulse is gonna climb. Think of it like you run a race. The other big issue or the big thing that your pulse is going to change its rate for is going to be to maintain a certain blood pressure. So let's say that the body wants to maintain blood pressure at 120 over 80, and it can do that with a pulse of 60, but then you start losing fluid, all right? In shock, we're losing blood. In diabetes, we're just losing fluid in general. So you're, you're, you know, you're going to the bathroom all the time trying to pee out that glucose. So you're losing, you're dehydrating. Either way, you're losing fluid. So now you've got less liquid in your bloodstream. So your blood pressure is gonna fall. So now your pulse is gonna climb up to try to bring your blood pressure back. So you're gonna see a high pulse with a maintained blood pressure. So you might have normal 120 over 80, but your pulse is rocking at 150. Um, that's a sign of shock. If you think about what shock is, shock doesn't just mean you bled out. Shock doesn't mean that you've got an allergic reaction or anything like that. There's different types of shock. Hypovolemic shock, which means you've lost too much fluid, may not be any blood. You can go into hypovolemic shock with all of your blood still in your bloodstream. It's the other fluid you lost. It's your, your water. So dehydration can lead to hypovolemic shock. Diabetes can lead to hypovolemic shock. That's why I wanted to point this out. These vitals right here, if you get a patient, be it in a, in a uh, scenario or the real world or anything like that, if you start to see signs of shock, it really doesn't matter what's wrong with the patient at that point. We need to treat the shock. So what is the treatment for shock? Chill. <laughs> no, sadly, that's not it. Fluids. Yeah, fluids, but we can't really give fluids as basics. Right. There's it's a it's a surprisingly simple, almost face palm level um, list of things that we do. We basically just cover the patient and loosen restrictive clothing. And as a basic, that's it. That's all you do. And you do what you can to stop the fluid loss because if it is blood loss, obviously we don't want them to keep bleeding. But when it comes to something of this sort where they're losing all their fluid by urination or something that we can't really stop, um, we need to directly replace that fluid. And we can't do it. But if this is a patient and you're in somebody's living room, um, your, if you've got a paramedic partner, your partner is going to wind up hooking up an IV or even an advanced EMT. Advanced EMTs can use, can do, um, fluid resuscitation. So, you know, pretty much every level higher than what this class is, is able to give an IV to try to bring that blood pressure up and take that pressure off the heart. So the heart's, the pulse can come down, it can relax and the blood pressure will hopefully climb up a bit. Um, and then we want to keep them warm because when the blood starts to get shunted from the skin, we start to lose the ability to maintain our blood, our body temperature. And we don't want our patients to go into um, hypothermia. But anyway, so if they're hypoglycemic and they're unconscious, you may have to treat for shock, even though your typical things that you're looking at, like massive blood loss, trauma, and all that may not, may not be there, right? Because that's not really what we're treating when we treat for shock. We're treating this stuff. All right, altered mental status, anxious or combative behavior, seizures, fainting, coma. These are starting to get further and further down the drain with um, your mental status. Weakness on one side of the body. What's that sound like? A stroke, right? Yeah, so at this point, again, we're hitting some major, major problems with the brain. So weakness on one side of the body seizures, coma, death, that kind of thing. Hypoglycemia is quickly reversed by giving the patient glucose. Now we can do this. Uh, EMTs can give glucose. The only issue is, is we can only really give it by mouth. And there's a cardinal rule that we can never break. And that is if the patient is not completely alert, we can't put anything in their mouth. So we can only really treat hypoglycemia as long as our patient is alert and able to follow directions. Once they fall, uh, once they fall um, 
they start falling down into that responsive to pain, verbal, unresponsive levels, we can't give them oral glucose anymore. All right, so pay attention to that when you're looking at registry questions and you get a diabetic question and it says, you have a patient that's got these symptoms and, and one of them is confusion or he's alert, he's you walk in the room and you introduce yourself and he just grunts in your general, or he just grunts and he doesn't answer you directly or something like that. Even if glucose, oral glucose is an option in your uh, answers, it's probably the wrong one because the question wants to see if you know not to give it if, the, if their mental status is altered. Um, those, those trick questions, it's, it's not really a trick question, but those questions like that, it's not, sometimes they're testing your knowledge to see if you know when not to do something as much as it is when to knowing what to do. All right, so let's talk about our assessment. In fact, the way I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna have you guys go through, we've done, we've beat assessments to death, but I want this to be knowing it like you know your phone number. Or maybe I should say your name because I, I don't hardly know my phone number anymore these days. Um, so let's talk about the scene size up. Patients are gonna be diabetics, but you don't necessarily know that yet. So I need you to get yourself to that point. What's the first thing we do in our, in our assessment? Doesn't matter if it's- You talking about when we first like, like let's say we doing the scene to where we entering the patient house or something like that? Yes. So you just pulled up. You are still sitting in your ambulance. PPE. PPE. Right. There you go. So your assessment at BSI scene safety thing happens before you ever even get out of your truck. All right. So that's your first two steps of your scene size up. There's six steps total. What's the other four? Once you put your PPE on, then you check the surface or you check the surrounding of the safety. Okay. Um, BSI, scene safety. Okay. What comes next? Then after that, uh, you go and uh, make sure that is the patient uh, is okay, per okay. se. Now, before you get the, to your patient. You determine the MOR or the NOR. All right, so that's another step. Yep, I want you guys to think about your size up in a, in a priority list. So there's six steps total, all right? But I want you to think of three priorities. The first priority is yourself, right? Always take care of number one. So BSI, scene safety, that is your safety. Then I want you to think about what do you have in front of you? How many patients do you have? Again, you know, yes, tonight in class, we're talking about diabetes, but if you showed up to um, a mass casualty incident, or, you know, call of X amount of people down in the parking lot for unknown reasons. You've got your safety taken care of. Now we want to figure out what we're dealing with because you may not want to provide care to the first person you come across. They may not need it. They may already be dead. You don't want to waste time when the person past them really needs your attention. So your second priority is going to be your triage. All right, and so there's two steps. One is there, Samantha Mitchell named it. It's um, determine the number of patients. So if, you, if you're the only ambulance and you have one patient, do you need another ambulance? We'll get to no. that. So MOI, NOI is part of it, but that comes next. All right, so, but if you show up and you have three patients and they're all critical or any of that sort, you may need some help, right? So that's your next step, that triage. You take care of yourself first, BSI scene safety. Then you look at your scene and you have, how many patients do I have? What am I dealing with? And do I need help? That could be help as in extra ambulances. That could be call the power company, call the fire department, call the coroner, call your mama. I, I don't know. Um, call for help, right? That's steps four, I'm sorry, three and four. And then steps five and six, now you're at your patient, all right? So take care of yourself, do your triage, figure out who you're gonna work on. And then when you get to your patient, that's the last two steps of your scene size up. So you're gonna be, what's going on, right? What's my mechanism of injury or my nature of illness? That's what that last line is on the scene, on the slide. 
So that's where you come in, Bailey, with that. That's your next to last step. Just real quick, what happened to my patient? What am I dealing with? And then the last step is considering C-spine. In other words, you want to consider, did trauma happen? In class, we're only ever going to give you one scenario. You're, you're, if it's the diabetic patient, diabetes, it's all I really want you to worry about because, I'm, we're, because we're training, right? But in the real world, if your diabetic patient went into a diabetic coma while driving 80 miles an hour down the interstate, you have diabetes and probably some pretty bad trauma at the same time because something had to stop them. And it was either a tree or another car or a barrier or you know something of that sort. So that's your size up is stepping you through basically from the minute you open your ambulance door to the minute you actually start patient care. All right. And that's your, your priorities. You take care of yourself, figure out what you're dealing with as far as a whole scene. And then when you've got your scene in front of you and you know what's going on, you pick your patient and you, now you're dealing with your patient. So that's what's here. Um, all of these chapters that we're doing in module three, and I believe module four as well, is going to have sections that are devoted to doing your size up. Because now, or not just your size up, your whole, your whole assessment. You guys have been through module two. That's where we learned all this. You've been through the boot camp for that module. So we'll refresh on it. But what we're going to start doing is, is now we're going to start plugging in actual scenarios like tonight's diabetes. So we're going to be looking at medical assessment. And I'm going to have you guys asking extra questions that have to do with diabetes and providing your interventions and stuff. We will start to flesh these things out, but we really can't do that if you're still struggling to get that framework, that basic framework set up. So don't let the stuff that you did in module two get rusty. All right. All right. So once you get through your scene size up, now you're going to start your primary assessment. And that is your general impression, which is basically sick or not sick. Um, sorry, I just got a text. Once you've got your general impression, you get your level of consciousness. Um, and a lot of times that's done just automatically, right? If you walk in and your patient's up talking to you, well, great, they're alert. That's all you need. Keep moving. If you walk in and they're laying on the ground looking like a corpse, now we got to figure out if we're going to do CPR or not. So that step becomes a little bit bigger and a whole lot more important. But, um, for a general patient where you look at them and you can see that they're breathing, even if they're unconscious or, um, or they're talking to you and telling you that they don't feel very good. Their stomach hurts, their chest hurts, whatever. That level of consciousness check is pretty much automatic. So you can go right into your ABCs. All right. For airway and breathing, a lot of times we kind of put these together. The first thing you want to do is just make sure that they have an airway. If they're alert, they've got it. Um, if they are starting to nod off, then we need to start considering different airway adjuncts, depending on what we're dealing with. And we're going to want to give them oxygen. Um, we used to give every patient oxygen. We really don't anymore. Now it's just, we want to make sure that we are keeping them above 94, but less than hundred. If you look at their O2 sats and it tells you they're rocking hundred, you want to dial back the oxygen a little bit. If you look at your assessment sheets, it just says that the only critical fail to do with the oxygen is that you failed to consider and ultimately give it. It doesn't say you have to give them 15 liters. Um, and all of your assessments will need your patients to get oxygen. But if you can just say when you get to A and B, it's like, all right, he's got an airway. Um, I don't see any need for oxygen or I would consider oxygen. If you decide not to give it, just say that you considered it and you decided not to give it. Your evaluator may ask you why, as long as you can justify it, you're cool. All right, but notice that we want to take care of this first. So we're not jumping straight to oral glucose. You walk in and the, the wife is like, my husband's having a diabetic emergency. His glucose is blah, 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 blah. It's 12 or something like that. You still don't go straight to the glucose, all right? We have to we we have to follow these steps, especially in class when you're going to be tested on it. Still got to do your size up. Still do your ABCs in order. Make sure that your airway is good. Fix it before you move on. Um, when you do move on, you move on to breathing. Make sure your breathing is good before you move on. Move on to circulation, so on and so on. Um, even in the real world, like a paramedic will tell you that they still do this. They just do it in their head. 
a lot of this stuff is done in their head. Like they'll walk up and introduce themselves to the patient and say, what's going on today? And when the patient, the minute the patient starts talking to them, they've knocked out their level of consciousness. They've knocked out their general impression. They've knocked out most of their primary A, B, and C. Um, they just did it in their head. They thought about it. You don't have to actually out loud say, all right, I'm checking your airway, that kind of thing. We just teach you that in school because we want you to make sure that you know the steps. So if you're going to do stuff in your head, you still know what you're doing. For circulation, uh, you're looking for dry, warm skin. That's if they if you have that, they have high, a lot of times that's going to be hyperglycemia, because what's happening is is that they're trying to space out. They've put more fluid into the blood. The blood vessels are dilated. They're trying to basically make more room to lower the concentration of glucose in the bloodstream. And if they do that, they need to start depositing in places. So your blood vessels are going to open up. Your skin is going to um, basically act as a reservoir. All the vessels in your skin are going to act as kind of a temporary storage, like almost like if you walked into an, a busy ER and they've got patients lined along the wall in the hallway. That's basically what's happening here. You've got too much sugar. You've got too many patients in the ER. There's not enough rooms for everybody. So they start using the hallway. That's what your body is doing is it's using the bloodstream or blood vessels rather. And because of that, your skin's gonna get warm. Um, it's gonna be dry. It's gonna be flushed, that kind of thing. They may have red skin. It may look like they're not really breaking out in hives, but they're gonna be, they're gonna be flushed. Um, on the flip side of that, if you're hypoglycemic, now you don't have enough sugar. So the body's going to say like, all right, our blood sugar is low. So we need to make sure that the sugar that's in the blood is where it needs to be. So it's going to shunt it and put it toward your internal organs and your core and in your head. And that's why hypoglycemia can mimic um, shock is because it's doing the same thing. It's just doing it for different reasons. So all that blood leaves your skin. Now you have moist, pale skin because there's no blood there. It's all at your organs where it, where it needs to be. Um, and then you're going to have that rapid weak pulse again, because in hypoglycemia, your body starts to go down the shock route. And so you're going to start to see all those signs that mimic it. So if you see this, um, if you don't have the means to fix it, if there's a, a lot of times, if there's a paramedic on scene, they'll give glucose and the patient wakes up and then everything's fine. They go about their very way. Um, hold on, hold on a second, guys. It's from the lower than you see. Oh, probably, no, I think it's, um, it looks like you did look it up against something, maybe not the, uh, from your socks or, your, or your, if you were wearing sandals, they can do that. Okay. All right. Um, so you're going to determine your decision, your transport decision. If you can fix the diabetes on the spot, especially if it's a known diabetic, and it could be something as simple as they just forgot to eat. A lot of times in the real world, what will happen is that the paramedic will give them some D10 or D50, wake them up, and then stick around for a bit while they eat a sandwich or something of that sort, just to get some carbs in their system. And then we let them sign a refusal if they're alert, and we go back to our station. Uh, if they're not a known diabetic, if the glucose doesn't work, if they're hyperglycemic, because uh, we can't, again, we can't fix that, right? So those patients typically will get transported. When in doubt, just transport. All right. If you don't really know, even in the real world, if you're not sure, go ahead and take them. Unless they just flat out tell you no and they are in the right mindset to do so. Think back to uh, chapter three, I think, for your legal stuff. And then, you know, make your decision from there. But yes, uh, we do oftentimes get refusals for diabetic emergencies, particularly from people that are known diabetics. All right, for your history taking, investigate your chief complaint. You're gonna get a sample on every patient, no matter what their problem is. If it's a stub toe, diabetes, broke neck, um, bleeding from places that shouldn't be bleeding, you know, burns when you pee, I don't know, whatever it is, you're gonna get a sample history for all of them. OPQRST, that's more for things you can't really see. So. If they tell you that their stomach hurts, you're, you're going to get an OPQRST because that's you're getting information about um, 
symptoms that you can't otherwise gauge, right? There's no quantitative way for you to do it. It's all quality based. So um, a broken leg, you really don't need OPQ or SC. If you look at it and you see the bone sticking out, well, I know why it hurts and I know where it hurts because I can see it. Um, but you're still going to get a sample. All right. Some things that you want to pay attention to when you're getting your history. Well, let's start with this. I'm going to play a game. I'm going to pick a name. Don't everybody leave the room. <laughs> I want y'all to think about your sample and your OPQRSE. We're only going to worry about sample for now. All right. So I will start y'all off, but Bailey, since you're at the top of my list, we're going to go with you. Um, so sample history, signs and symptoms. What is A? Signs and symptoms for as Bailey, you can Bailey, oh. Bailey, 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 sorry. Bailey Ramsey. Oh. What's the, what's the A in sample? This also lets me know that you're still here and awake. Which you may not be. All right, uh, Caesar, what's A? There we go, allergies. Good, so allergies here, um, the typical meds that we give for diabetes, don't really pertain to allergies. So just asking them what they've got is good to know, but nothing in your toolbox really depends on it. So there's not a whole lot of specific questions you're gonna ask there. All right, Denise, if you're with us, uh, what is M in sample? I'm, I'm here. Uh, <laughs> M in sample. Just the M. We have signs and symptoms, allergies. Medicine. Good. Medications, right? All right. Mm -hmm. So what's the typical medication that somebody would be prescribed for diabetes? We talked about it earlier. It also starts with Ryan. Mommy, you look good in my channels. <laughs> If you don't know, that's okay. This is, it's a medication that you don't know. I'll, I'll pass. Okay. So it's metformin. All right. That's okay. Yeah. There we go. Good job. Welcome back, Bailey. I'll give you the next question. Um, so, yes, metformin is a typical medication that people um, with diabetes will take. Now, metformin is meant to be a long term effect kind of medication. So, if they missed a dose, that should not technically be causing their issue. Um, but it still doesn't hurt to ask if they're compliant with it, right? Just see if they've taken it for the day. Um, sometimes people will take it to start their day, but because of the GI issues, a lot of times they may wait and take it at the end of the day after they're done eating um, or they're getting ready to go to sleep, that kind of thing. So it just depends. Different people will take it at different times. So if they call you at two o'clock in the afternoon and they're not supposed to take it for another four hours based on their rotation, they may tell you they haven't taken it that day, but just try to get, try to understand and get what, what they take if they've taken it. Um, I don't know anybody that would want to take more metformin. That stuff is, like I said, nobody likes it. That's a, that's a tough medication. Um, all right, so moving on, Bailey, what is the P in sample? Yep, good. So past history, pertinent history, whatever you want to look at it. Uh, again, you know, I don't need to know that they broke their ankle or stubbed a toe when they were six years old because they jumped out the swing backwards and landed wrong. We're looking at things that may be pertaining to what's going on and why they called 911. So diabetes would be a great one. Um, what else? Uh, just getting over a sickness. If they just had a bad sickness like COVID or the flu. Um, if they are on dialysis is something you may want to know, those kind of things. So try to keep it relevant. Let's see. All right. Joseph, uh, what is L? And then Leah, you're going to get E afterward.
You with us, Joseph? Leah, I may be handing you the L. All right, Leah, if you're with us, go ahead and take L. What's L in sample? Good, last oral intake, right. And that's especially important for, para for diabetic questions, right? Because that directly affects their glucose. So we wanna know that if they're type one, um, going back to the medications, when was the last time you took your insulin shot? And oh, by the way, did you eat? You wanna put those together. Um, good, all right. And then let's see, Rebecca Kimbrell, what's, I'll give that one, the last one to you. What is E? Events leading up to it. Right. Awesome. Yeah. And a lot of times um, that question gets kind of answered in the process. But if you want more information, that's where you would ask that. So like if I wanted to know if they took their insulin shot. Um, I can close that. Maybe. It, I feel like that. Anyway, yeah, if I want to know if they took their insulin shot for the day, that could be a medication question. It could also be an events leading up to. Because if they forgot to eat and they took it then the insulin is actually the problem. It's not necessarily that they had a metabolic emergency. It's that they just took too much insulin, right? So that was an event that they accidentally did. All right, good. Talked about these, we went over sample. Your physical exam for any of your uh, medical, we're gonna take a break here in a second. I know it's been about an hour. Um, your physical exams are not necessarily your head to toe trauma exams, like what we're going to teach you in module four. All right. I want you guys to, yeah, give your patient a quick once over, like look and see if anything looks weird. If they, if you see swelling, um, you know, swollen extremities, if their feet, if it looks like it's about time to chop off the right foot, that kind of thing. Um, but I don't need you to necessarily poke and pride on their head, checking their nose and, and all that stuff, because that's not really why they called 911. And they're gonna look at you like you're crazy and probably claim assault and we really, it's just bad for everybody, except people looking for a good story on the news. Um, so in your medical assessment, if you look at the sheet, it actually says body system exam. So all that means is, is if everything up to this point has been pointing you down the diabetic route, I want you to think endocrine right? Think diabetes. I don't want you to try start trying to deal with asthma when you're looking at a diabetic patient. That's what you're looking about here. All right. If they are completely unresponsive, then give them a quick head to toe. But again, you're not looking for broken bones and trauma. You're looking for something maybe like a bee sting, maybe something that caused them to go unconscious. Um, if you do a head to toe and you find the insulin pump and the insulin pump is empty, um, that could be an issue could be either way. If it messed up and dumped everything into them, that's a problem. If it was empty for a while and it couldn't give them any insulin at all, that's also a problem. All right, vital signs. Anytime there's altered mental status um, or you're dealing with a diabetic, get a glucose. I would say get a glucose on everybody. I think it's a good idea. However, that means you're sticking everybody and that's not always good for your patients. Um, consider that if they're, if they don't look like they're the type, you don't want to, you don't want to stick them. If you don't think you need to, then save them the pain. Don't stick them, but don't be afraid to get that glucose if you need it. All right. And then for the reassessment, if you have a patient that called you for a diabetic emergency and it is a legitimate emergency, are they stable or unstable? Let me actually let me let me let me change that question up. Okay, you show up to a type one diabetic. All right. He's unconscious. You um your partner gives him glucose and then he wakes up and says, Oh crap, I forgot to eat and I took a, I took too many insulin shots. Does that sound like is that somebody you would want to um take to the hospital or get a refusal? Take to the hospital. Take him to the hospital, right. Now, a follow-on question to that, dealing with the reassessment. Do you feel like that's a stable patient that can have vitals taken every 15 minutes or an unstable patient that needs to have them done every five minutes? Every five. Every five, good. Now, can anybody tell me why that is? What's our concern? 
he oh where well, I call it a slick way in the emergency room, we call it OD, but he took too much. He need to calm down. Right. Yeah. How do you know that the uh, sugar you gave him to wake him up is going to be enough, right? What if um, there's more in too, still too much insulin in the system and it crashes him again? So you want to go ahead and just get him, go ahead and get him to the hospital, let them watch him. Because in EMS, the name of our game is to hurry up and get him in and out of our truck as fast as possible. Um, not to the point where you're not treating them properly, but we're, we're emergency response. So we need to be ready for the next call. We need to not sit in somebody's house for an hour just to see if they crash again. Um, let, you know, if, if that's what you feel like they need, then the, what they need is to go to the ER. Um, and if you're worried about that, then yes, they are unstable. So you're going to reassess all of your vital signs, especially including your glucose every five minutes. Um, if it winds up being that you think it's a stable patient, maybe they, they're type two, and um, they just had a random hypoglycemic attack. You gave them some, some sugar if they were awake to take um, directions or your paramedic partner gave them some D10 and they're like, oh, cool. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I'm good now. I, I'm a known diabetic. I know, I know why this happened and everything and I'm fine. Then yes. Okay. You can, you can get a refusal. Why is that? Okay, there we go. All right, reassess your interventions. It's not just about your vital signs. You also wanna make sure that your interventions are still holding up. So the, the easiest way that I've always talked about these is think of it from a trauma standpoint. If you had to put a tourniquet on somebody, you don't wanna just put it on there and then forget that it exists, right? Because what if the tourniquet fails and they start bleeding out again? Um, or let's say you put an airway in somebody, uh, but they start to vomit. Your OPA is not going to stop them from aspirating their vomit. So you have to suction. We'll get more. You already went through the airway chapter, so you all know that. Um, you want to make sure that you check those things as well, in addition to their vital signs. And if there's any question about giving glucagon or something of that sort, um, which is actually, yeah, I'm glad the slide said that. Glucagon is beyond EMT competencies, but the advanced EMTs can give it. So you may very well see it on your truck. Um, if you're not sure what to do, consult med control. If med control determines that glucagon needs to be given, depending on the system you work in, they may tell you that you can. I know that Indiana can do it. Um, found that out interesting ways on one of our last classes. Um, and since we teach multiple states, multiple areas, I don't want to tell you that you just flat out can't do it because your district, your uh, system may allow it. But if you're not sure, consult your med control. When in doubt, call the doctor that you're operating under because it's his license. All right. If unable to test for a blood glucose level, then perform a thorough assessment and treat it like a hypoglycemia. If you can give sugar, go ahead and give sugar just in case. But yeah, they're definitely going to the hospital at that point. If you made a blind intervention like that, so that's okay. That's not a problem, but don't leave them. All right. They need to go and get seen. And then of course, make sure you document and communicate. And we're gonna talk more about that when we do scenarios. All right, we'll take a 10 minute break here. I'll be back at 8.20 and we'll resume with the medications, which are not very long for an EMT.
All right, we're going to get back to it. It's close enough. Um, so let's talk about the medication. Now, for you guys as EMTs, it's pretty easy. You guys have oral glucose. There's three different types. You have rapidly dissolving, you have the chewable tablets, and you have a liquid formulation. But they're all oral, right? They're all given by mouth. So the only real contraindication for this is that they have to be able to swallow, and they have to be able to they have to be alert enough to take direction. Because if you stick something in their mouth and they're unconscious or can't swallow, they're going to aspirate it. And now we've got airway issues that we didn't have before. So make sure that they can actually swallow what you're giving them and then give it if they need it. If you feel if they're low on blood sugar or if you just don't know. All right. If you have to give it and there's not a uh, paramedic there, go ahead and provide transport. You can have a paramedic come out to assess. A lot of trucks have um, paramedics either on scene or, or I'm sorry, on the truck or um, nearby enough that they can come out there and assess with you if you need to. If your system allows you to get refusals and you're confident that their patient's gonna be fine, then you can go ahead and do that. All right, so when we talk about seizures, um, did y'all already went over the neuro chapter. So we talked about seizures in depth the other night, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. So yeah, there's six slides to this. I'm not going to go over all six of them because you just covered it in a previous chapter. The big thing to know is that these seizures are no different than a normal seizure. You're going to treat them the same. Um, and you're, you know, don't put your finger in their mouth, watch their heads. Don't let them hit anything. Um, give oxygen when you can. And understand that even though the seizure itself may not be a problem, like if it's just a quick happens and then it's done, that seizure itself may not have been dangerous. But what caused it could be dangerous, right? So seizures are a problem, not, not always within themselves, but what's causing the seizures can be the problem. So in this case, if the blood glucose is too far out of whack, if the diabetic emergency is getting way, way, way out there, the extreme end of the uh, signs and symptoms include the seizures, the loss of consciousness, coma, and death, and all that. And seizures is kind of getting to that end of the spectrum. So if you see it, they're way beyond any kind of refusal. Like that's, that's a joke at that point. They need to go. All right. But you're pretty much just going to treat the seizures like you would, like you were taught in the neuro chapter. Um, your goal is to keep them, keep their airway clear and get them to a hospital. All right. So let's talk about hematologic emergencies. So now we're shifting gears. We're not really talking about diabetes anymore. Uh, so actually, before we move into hematologic emergencies, does anybody have any questions about diabetes? Any myths, any concerns, anything that you've heard that you're not quite sure if it's real or not? Uh, anything to do with treatments? So I got, I got one question. What is the first signs like if you feel like the, a patient has diabetes or like what is, what, is, what is the mainly the sign that everybody looks for, for when they come down to some diabetes? I've been so confused about that. Like I know when somebody has it. Yeah, I know the steps to do on top of that. But what so you're talking about like if like for me, for example, I don't have diabetes, but what would be some of the first things I would notice that would make me question if I have diabetes? Exactly. Um, all right. So lapses in memory, uh, mental issues. Uh, if I've, if you pass out, if you ever have a moment where you black out and then you come back to um, losses in time, a lot. You, now you notice a lot of this has to do. If you're talking about for yourself, like what you would notice, a lot of it is going to circulate circulate around mental issues because those are going to be the things that you see. We don't normally make a habit of stabbing our own fingers if we don't need to, right? So me, I would never know, at least not to start, that would not be, low blood sugar would not be what I would see because I'm not just gonna randomly stab my finger and look at my blood glucose. I would start to have mental issues. And in one of my moments of clarity, I would either A, me, myself, I would check my own damn sugar. Um, if it was somebody who's not medically inclined or, or doesn't have a clue, 
That's what 911 is for. So they may call you out because they're having problems with mental status. Um, that's usually going to be the first thing that tips people off to it. And so with that being said, when you get called out for these, they may not say, hey, I want you to come see if I got diabetes. They may just say like, hey, I keep passing out. Hey, I had this random seizure. I don't, I don't normally have seizures. Um, uh, you know, stuff of that sort. Okay, so like the nail places ask if you have diabetes, is that because some don't have feeling? Yeah. Yeah, so if you've got diabetes and it's untreated, remember your extremities may not heal. Um, so you're going to run into untreated diabetes if you pick up something heavy and it causes micro tears to your muscles, like, like if you were to go to the gym, for example. But if you're not taking care of your diabetes, you're probably not going to the gym either. Um, but if you pick up something heavy and it causes that micro tear in your muscles, like going to the gym would, those may not heal. So you may be sore and the soreness will stay for longer. Um, and then yes, and the extreme ends, it could cause necrosis and that kind of thing. So going to places like getting your nails done, I think what it is, is that they're concerned that if they cause any kind of, um, injury to you, if they like tear your skin, something of that sort, you're not going to heal. Uh, diabetes is not contagious, so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be any concern of theirs as to whether or not they might get it from you or something of that sort. That's a good question. Um, that's a real good question, actually. I've never been asked that, but yeah, that's that's a good one. Any other questions? Anybody else have stuff that you may um, may have heard or just don't know? Okay. All right. Well, I mean, that door is always open. You can ask me here. You can ask me in Discord. Um, if you want to get it from other instructors, if you, you know, maybe they've got a better way of explaining something than I do. We're all in Discord. So you can always ask the questions there. And every instructor for every level of EMS, including our, our advanced levels, can see those questions and answer them. So let's talk about hematologic emergencies. We mentioned this at the beginning. What does HEMA stand for? HEMA or HEMO? Hemo stands for infection, right? Uh, no, not infection, but it has to do with the blood. There you go. So Caesar, you got it. Um, hematologic means issues in the blood. And it, well, it's right there on the slide. So hematology is a study of blood-related diseases. Um, three disorders that can be create that can create a pre-hospital emergency. These are the three that we want to worry about. There's a bunch of them out there, like leukemia, um, different things, but we don't really deal with those right we would like to know about them because they may affect some of our treatments but they themselves are not typically going to cause people to call 911 um, they're just going to be things that we want to know about but these three things sickle cell disease hemophilia a and the thrombophilia those things will have emergencies um, associated with them that you may get called 911 for now what are you going to do with them Ultimately, the short answer is pretty much just O2 and transport. But um, there's going to be some things that you want to be aware of so that you don't make a mistake and cause more harm than good. All right, So that's what we're going to go over. And I also want you guys to have a good knowledge of what these are and what they can cause. Because even though you may only do oxygen and transport directly for this, if this is running rampant, like sickle cell, for example, um, that can cause other issues that will lead you down a whole other stew, spew of things that you have to deal with that you would really hope you didn't have to if, um, if you could have headed some things off ahead of time. So that's what we're gonna go over tonight, all right? Your anatomy and physiology review for these, and by the way, hematology is not gonna be nearly as much of this chapter as um, diabetes was, we're over the hump. So let's talk about your blood. You've got erythrocytes, leukocytes, platelets, and plasma. Who can tell me what erythrocytes are? Red blood cells. Red blood cells, all right. They're your transport. They look like water balloons because they fill up like water balloons. Um, they do carry a lot of fluid in them, but the fluid is not what they're meant to transport. The fluid is just a medium to hold it. So the red blood cells contain hemoglobin, 
and um, iron. And those are the things that grab the oxygen so that the O2 or so the red blood cells can carry the oxygen throughout the body. Now, um, they're normally, like I said, they look like water balloons under normal conditions. A red blood cell looks like almost like a donut, but instead of having a hole, it's just an indention. All right. So it's a solid piece, but it's got kind of like a little dip in the middle. Leukocytes are your white blood cells. So there's a few different types. We won't get way out into the college anatomy level stuff here, but just know that there's a couple different types of leukocytes, a couple different types of white blood cells is another term for it. And they all fight diseases and infections in a different way. Um, and they're very, very large, all right? A white blood cell compared to a red blood cell is like an elephant compared to a mole rat. When you look at them under a microscope, you've got a bunch of little red blood cells all over the place. And these giant honking white blood cells kind of just interspersed between them. And they're sometimes 10, 15 size, times larger than the red blood cells. Um, which when we start talking about things like leukemia, um, that size difference can, when you think about what leukemia does, you can kind of see how that size is a big factor in that. That's why I point that out. Platelets are used to form clots. Platelets are supposed to be the only thing that is used to form clots as far as blood cells go. Um, when we start talking about sickle cell, though, you're going to see where you get a little bit too many, too many people wanting to help in that sense. But your platelets are by design supposed to be able what, to be what stops you from clotting. And then the way they work, they're like Velcro. All right. So if you let's say you have a, um, a cut in your blood vessel and now your blood's going out that cut, the platelets are going to start to hook into it. Some are going to hook to the uh, edge of the blood vessel tear, and then some more are going to hook to those red blood, uh, platelets, and then some more are going to hook to those platelets, and eventually they're all going to kind of form this mesh clot that um, seals up the hole. That's how we clot. We can take medications that will slow that process. We will take medications uh, on purpose. We'll take some that do it inadvertently as a side effect. We take medications that speed up that process. You know, it just depends. Um, but that's what the platelets are meant to do. And the platelets aren't really cells. They don't have a nucleus. They are, um, it's kind of disgusting to think about it, but there are certain cells in your bloodstream that create the platelets. And all they do is they just shed. It's like shedding skin and that's your platelets. So the platelets are like little pieces of like, I guess you could say like fingernail clippings. Imagine that you have these cells that are just popping off little microscopic fingernail clippings in your blood and that's your platelets. Um, they're dead, they're, they're not living things, but they're not dead like necrotic dead. They're meant to be that way. Uh, and then you have your plasma. Your plasma is basically the liquid. That's your transport medium. That's what gives you a liquid consistency to your blood because red blood cells are solid, white blood cells are solid. Platelets are definitely solid. If you didn't have plasma, there would be no movement. It would just be a block of gunk that would be your blood. Um, so the plasma is what allows all those different solid blood cells to move through. And plasma is pretty much just water, by the way. All right, so let's talk about sickle cell disease. This is a disease that is um, predominantly in African-American and just African societies, or, um, demographics. It's not exclusive to them. Um, it's a hereditary thing. So some white, you know, some Caucasian people can have it, Asians can have it, but they're much less likely vast majority of people that you see have it are either going to be African-American or they're going to have African-American in their family line. Some, somehow it passed down that way. Um, and what sickle cell is, is basically those red blood cells. Remember how I described them? They look like nice plush donuts. Um, sickle cell anemia is where those blood cells shrivel up like raisins. And because of their shape, when they do that, a couple things happen. First of all, they start to form this hook shape that looks like a sickle. That's where it gets its name from. Uh, the other issue is that they can't, they can't hold oxygen anymore. So if you've got X amount of red blood cells in your body and you have sickle cell anemia, when the sickle cell disease kicks in and it, has, and it flares up, your body's going to, let's say 30% of your red blood cells turn to sickle. All right. That means that you lost 30% of your oxygen carrying capacity. So your O2 sats are going to drop. 
you're going to have um, hypoxic issues with your organs, different issues with that. And the other problem is that those cells that have dried up, they are now acting like platelets. They're going to hook and catch things and they're going to form clots. So you run into the problem of not just having low oxygen, but you're also going to have clotting issues, which drives your risk of a stroke way, way, way up, right? Um, because platelets typically only activate when the body uh, realizes there's blood loss. Sickle cell activates, as far as I know, just because it's a Tuesday or whenever it, you know, whatever happened, it just, just starts. You don't have to lose any blood. You don't have to have an injury. It just does it. So you could have an, you can have a flare up at any time if you've got sickle cell disease. Um, but those are the things you want to keep in mind. So if you respond to somebody with sickle cell, one of your top priorities is going to be giving them oxygen, right? Because they're going to need more. They have less carrying capacity. So more oxygen is the only way, real way to treat that. Um, and they need to go to the hospital because they may need to, they may need to get some kind of um, thrombolytic, something to help stop the, the blood cells from clotting while they're in their emergency. We really don't give anything that's directly meant to stop that. Aspirin can do it. Aspirin's not a blood thinner. It's a platelet deaggregator. Um, and it would work for sickle cell, but that's an off-label use. So I can't tell you as an instructor to a student that you should give aspirin to your um, sickle cell patients. However, I will tell you that it might work. You know, So when you go to your field, when you go to your um, system, check with med control. And if you're on the scene, even if it's not in your protocols, you can always call and be like, hey, I got a patient with sickle cell. Can I give an aspirin? You know, something like that. Um, unless there's a reason, a lot of times the docs may not have a problem with saying, yes, go ahead and do it. And then you just get them to a hospital um, because the aspirin is not going to hurt them unless, as long as you can give it in general, it's really not going to hurt them. I just can't tell you that. That's not an official treatment. So um, lock that away in your toolkit and keep it for when you actually get out of school and into the field. All right, sickle cells have a short lifespan, which is good, right? They're gonna get out of your system pretty quick. Basically what's gonna happen is the, uh, the spleen is gonna collect them, all right? So, but anyway, so they'll result in more cellular waste products contributing to sludging of the blood. The spleen will collect them and try to get rid of them. Um, and then you wind up just digesting it and getting and, and excreting it out. But some of the com complications you're gonna run into are gonna be anemia right? So less red blood cells, um, gallstones, jaundice, because your liver is not getting the blood flow that it needs. Um, plus those sickle cells can start to clog up the, the ducts of the liver and splenic dysfunction. You can also get uh, vascular occlusions with ischemia. If those clots start to form, then they're going to stop blood flow. So you, like I said, you run the risk of a stroke, joint necrosis, um, specifically around the head of the femur and the humerus. So you're upper thigh, your upper arm, upper, upper arm around the uh, shoulder. You could have a lot of pain. If anybody in here has ever had, if anybody, I don't know if anybody's got it. I don't want you to talk about your medical history in class, but if you or somebody you know personally has sickle cell, you know that when it flares up, it hurts. It's not, it, it really is not comfortable. It's not like, oh yeah, I don't, you know, I think my sickle cell's kicking in. It is a full body head to toe, every single inch of you is in pain. Um, anywhere the blood's at, which is pretty much everywhere, you're gonna be in pain. Retinal hemorrhages, bleeding into your eyes basically, and an increased risk of infection. Uh, many of these complications are very painful and it can be life-threatening. So we don't wanna waste time, we wanna get them to the hospital. This picture right here is what your sickle cells look like. So you can see a normal healthy red blood cell, there's a bunch of them in there. And then these lighter colored ones, they're all shriveled up like raisins and they're, they're more solid. They're more likely to catch on things. Those are the ones that we wanna worry about. And the more cells that turn into that sickle cell, the worse it is, obviously. All right, hemophilia. Hemophilia is pretty rare. Um, it's only one in the, only about 20,000 Americans, sorry, have the disorder and it's mostly males. 
people with hemophilia have a decreased ability to create a clot after an injury, which can be life-threatening. So these are basically your um, free bleeders, as we've always called them. So these are people where you really don't want to give them an aspirin, right? They're already having a problem clotting. So this is an example of a time when you don't want to give somebody an aspirin. You're going to take a bad situation and make it worse. Now, if you are in a situation where you need to give it, I'm not saying don't, right? But that's definitely going to be one of those times where you might want to contact med control and get let them be the one to make that decision. Um, they may determine that the that the risk um, or the benefit outweighs the risk. Outweighs the risk. Jesus. People with hemophilia have a decreased ability to to create a clot after an injury, and so something very very minor, as far as bleeding is concerned, can become a life threat. Um, if they get hit with blunt force trauma and they have internal bleeding, that's going to be a massive, massive problem because we can't, you can't clot, you know, I can't put a four by four on internal bleeding and suddenly stop it from bleeding. It doesn't, doesn't do anything. So people with this disease, if they fall and fracture a bone, if they're elderly and fracture a hip, for example, um, it's going to be emergency surgery. They need a helicopter and they need to get to a hospital yesterday because that small injury may be a, an immediate life threat. Some common complications, uh, long-term joint problems that may require a joint replacement. So bad knees, things like that. Um, bleeding in the brain, intracerebral hemorrhage. If they, if, they, if they pop a blood vessel in the brain, uh, again, the inability to clot is gonna start to cause them to have massive blood loss into the brain cavity. and um, I really want to teach stroke to y'all. Have y'all already gone over strokes? I think that was in your, um, yes. Neuro chapter. That sucks. Okay. That's all right. Um, there's a lot of cool things to learn about strokes. I, I love teaching that one. Um, cause you can tell, you can tell from your patient whether or not they have a clot or they're bleeding. You can tell where the bleeding is at. If it's, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know. If I, I haven't watched the video. I don't, I don't know if Chris went over it or not. Um, so some of the differences, Caesar, if they're, if it's blood, if they're hemorrhagic stroke, they're, first of all, they're going to have a lot of pain. Blood's an irritant. Anything it comes in contact with outside of your blood vessels is going to hurt. It's going to burn. So if they have splitting severe headaches on in one spot of the head, um, along with the other signs of a stroke, it's probably going to be hemorrhagic because the blood is causing the pain. Uh, all that blood being displaced is going to put pressure on the optic nerve so, and it's going to do it from wherever the bleed is at. And so the eyes will actually track toward wherever the bleed's at. So if they're bleeding in the upper left side of the brain, their eyes are going to turn and look up toward where the bleed is at because it's putting pressure on the nerve. Um, if they are having signs of a stroke, but there's no pain, then you're probably looking at a, uh, a blood clot. Because if there's if the blood's not getting out, then there's nothing really to cause the pain. Those nerves are just dying for lack of oxygen at that point, and you're not going to feel that. Um, there's really no pain receptors in the brain itself. The pain that you're feeling is coming from the uh, from the lining on the inside of the skull, stuff like that. When blood comes in contact with that, that's what's causing the pain. But it's it's things like that, you know. And when so when you're asking questions, um, it really helps to know that kind of stuff. And then when you're dealing with something like this, for example, if they hit their head and they tell you that they've got this massive headache, splitting headache, 10 out of 10 pain, it's in this one spot where they hit their head earlier um, and it's throbbing, starting to spread or whatever. And it's, it's been a couple hours, you know, they're probably still bleeding and the blood is what's causing the head injury or what's causing the pain. Uh, that's a massive issue. They need to go to the hospital. Whereas you might be like, otherwise you may be like, well, you know, it's probably a bruise or something of that sort. All right, thrombophilia. This is a disorder in the body's ability to maintain the smooth flow of blood through the venous and arterial systems. So a concentration of particular elements in the blood can create clogging or blockage issues. Anybody ever heard of uh, deep vein thrombosis? Yes. This is, you're getting kind of down that road when you're dealing with this. So um, the blood starts to 
it doesn't really flow like it should. And anytime blood stops moving, it'll start to clot. Um, that's why people with AFib, uh, when you talk about cardiac emergencies and they talk about atrial fibrillation, if the blood starts to pool up in the atria because it's not being pumped properly, the blood will start to clot. And then depending on which atria it's in, that could cause a stroke or pulmonary embolism or something of those sorts. Um, and that's why a lot of people with AFib, they take aspirin every day or some kind of a blood thinner. They're fighting the, um, they're trying to stop their blood from clotting whenever it pulls up in those areas. But in this case, when you're dealing with thrombophilia or DVT, deep vein thrombosis, the problem is, is that this is clotting issues that are happening in the vessels and cells. So let's talk about that for a second. If I've got deep vein thrombosis, if I've got the risk of building a clot in my veins, where do you think the biggest risk is if I were to throw one of those clots? Do you think it's going to be in my brain? Am I going to have a stroke? Or is it going to be in my lungs? Where, where do you think the clot's going to get stuck if it forms in the vein? In the lungs. In the lungs. Good. I think I heard somebody say brain too. But um, if it's in the veins, it's going to go and it's going to get stuck in the lungs. So think about the flow of blood. You start, if you're going to start off in the vein, all right, which is not where we normally start with the flow of things. But if you're starting off in the vein and all veins go to the heart, then that clot is going to go to the heart. The vessels are getting bigger and bigger because you're going from a vein to the vena cava, which is a massive pipeline. And then that pours into the right atria, right ventricle. Then it goes out the pulmonary artery to the lungs. And now you're getting, now you're getting into the smaller vessels. So that clot's going to get stuck in the lungs. If it's forming in an artery, the artery is not going to the lung or to the heart. The artery is going out to the body. So as it gets smaller and smaller, you may get a clot in your leg. Sometimes that happens, which is a problem, but at least it's not a life threat. Um, but if it goes north rather than south, it's going to get stuck somewhere in your brain. Now you have, you're going to have a stroke. And it may be long-term, it may not be. So that's where your TIA versus your full-blown stroke comes in. If that clot breaks up and moves, it's a TIA, right? TIAs typically last 24 hours or less. So these kind of roping it back to tonight, DVT and uh, thrombophilia, the problem with these is that they start to create blood clots in random places throughout your blood vessels. So if they're in the arteries, um, you run the risk of a stroke. If they're in the veins, you run the risk of pulmonary thrombosis and neither of which are very good things. So they're at a high risk for that. They're at a high risk if they call 911, you're probably gonna be dealing with one of those two things. And they're being caused by one of these two things, either DVT or thrombophilia. I think that's it. Oh, and then of course your, um, your patient assessment. So it is 947. Yeah, we'll, we'll go through the assessment. And I think we have like one or two more slides after that, and we'll be done for the night. So home stretch, people. Um, so let's review this. In your scene size up, what are the six things that we must do in our scene size up? I want you guys to be able to rattle them off really, really easily so that you're not trying to remember what you forgot while you move forward with the more critical aspects of your assessment. PPE. All right. So BSI, right? BSI, scene safe. BSI, scene safe. Yeah. Um, your number of patients. Good. If you, if you need additional units Good. and your MOI or NOI, and Good. then stabilization is C spine. Excellent. So we took care of number one. Then we did our triage. Now we're taking care of our patient and we ruled out trauma. That's where that considering C-spine doesn't mean you're going to put a collar on them, right? It just means that you're considering the fact that you may have to. When you get to trauma, you're probably going to throw a collar on them. But in medical, we just want to make sure that trauma wasn't involved. For example, if it's a, um, a stroke patient that hit their head on the floor, elderly patient hit her head on the floor when she fell, could have been a medical issue that made her fall, um, like a cardiac issue. But the fact that she hit her head on the way down may cause the need for a C-spine. So that's why that's there. Not everything in the real world, in fact, very few, not very seldom, is it that cut and dry. All right. 
I have a question. Yes, go for it. So like when we're doing, say that example that you just used. Okay. You know, a patient has a heart attack or whatever and she hits her head. So like if, not that that scenario would be thrown out in our assessment test or whatever, but so at that point, we would say that it is a mechanism of injury or would we still consider that a nature of illness? I mean. So it would be both. That's why we, that's why we stay away from those in class. I don't give you scenarios where you're dealing with trauma and medical at the same time. In okay. Class, in class and even in your um, assessments, like when you go to do your psychomotor skills at the end, um, mm -hmm. you're going to get a medical assessment that is purely medical, but you still have to say that you're going to assess C-spine because that's one of the checklist items in your, on your sheet. Um, but you can rest comfortably that your assessment, unless you're in paramedic school and they're just wanting to pick on you, um, your assessment's going to be either strictly medical or strictly trauma or strictly BLS. And the even better part is and in the door what it's going to be. Um, so that'll help. Let's see. Do we do our motor skills with the same person we did skills camp with at the same location? So no. Um, the person that does your actual scenario, your actual uh, psychomotor evaluation cannot be an instructor. Like because I'm teaching you guys, I can't be your evaluator. Um, Chris Wally can't be your evaluator. Whoever did your skills at your location can't be your evaluator. It's got to be somebody disinterested in the program and that they did not teach you. Um, but it can be anybody. It can, it, all they have to be is an EMT. So that's the good thing about it. They're going to have the checklists. Uh, they don't have to have any instructor credentials to teach. They just need to be able to, they need to have the patch that they're evaluating you to. So yes, it just, it's, it's a person by person thing. They don't have to be from a different location. So if there's somebody you want, if there's somebody that wants to evaluate, that's fine, but they have to, they may have to go out of their way not to officially teach you anything um, in the class. Even just one lecture or one day of skills will disqualify them from being a uh, evaluator. So just make sure they know that, or make sure y'all know that too, so that you don't let them, don't let them teach you anything official. Um, But you know, going back to the original question, you're you're not going to get a mix. The reason we teach you and tell you about the mixes is because your first call when you go out to the real world is it may be, it could be the guy that had a heart attack. Like I said, you know, I use that a lot. Has a heart attack driving down the road, winds up in a wreck. Now he's having a heart attack and a trauma. Um, that's and you've got to kind of juggle back and forth between your assessments to to what. What's the bigger priority at that particular given moment? And you may you may hop assessments in your head four or five times um, in that one call, but we don't we don't train y'all for that because a lot of that is you get to do a lot of that with experience, not necessarily with book knowledge, which right now is what a lot of y'all are only getting. Uh, I know some of you work in the e in EMS already, but not everybody's got that. Primary assessment is going to be the same. So your general impression, sick or not sick. Um, you're going to be going through your ABCs, your level of consciousness. Give oxygen. Remember, if we're dealing with um, something to go, something to do with the blood, like sickle cell, we're going to be fighting hypoxia because for every red blood cell that turns into a sickle, that's less that the body can use to transport the uh, oxygen with. So the only thing we can do is give them more oxygen. You still want to try to maintain that 94 to 99%, but be a little bit more aggressive. Try to, don't let, if you see 94, don't be like, all right, well, they're good. Nah, you try to get them closer to that 99. It'll do them better. It'll, it'll help them stay a little bit better off. All right, manage any respiratory distress. Um, for sickle cell patients, you're going to notice that they have an increased heart rate. A lot of that is due to the fact that they're going to be hypoxic. 
um, when the body starts to realize that it's going into hypoxia, it tries to pick up the vital signs to get more oxygen flowing in. Your heart rate and your breathing go hand in hand. So if you are hypoxic, you're gonna to start to breathe more. Your body's trying to pull in more oxygen. When you breathe faster, your heart rate's gonna pick up with it. So for circulation, you're gonna see that. If you're dealing with any of the philias, um, just remember that they don't clot very well. So you're gonna do, you're gonna kind of go out of your way not to do anything that would make them bleed. And you're gonna go a little bit overboard trying to stop bleeds if you see them. Uh, if you think that you can control a bleed with four four by fours, maybe start with eight, that kind of thing. Because they're gonna keep bleeding for a lot longer than you would give them credit for normally. With your history taking, try to get some questions answered that have to do with what their, their history is. So your medical history, the pertinent medical history is gonna be a more important question in these. Figuring out if they have a history of sickle cell um, or if they're hemophilia, especially those, like, I think it's, I think it is hemophilia. That's the super rare one. So ask them, you know, they'll know. They get a paper cut and bleed for 20 minutes before it finally clots. That's, they probably have hemophilia. Either that or um, they're taking some kind of blood thinner that's, they're just overdoing it, you know. Phys physical signs indicating sickle cell, swelling of the fingers and toes, jaundice and priapism. Uh, no, we haven't gotten to trauma yet, but what is a priapism? Anybody know? A painful erection. Yep. Yeah. Um, or just an erection when there's no reason for it to be there. It's a sign of a head injury or, or a, um, a blood flow issue with the brain. If they're awake, it's painful. If they're unconscious, they may still have it, but obviously you're not going to know that they're in pain because they're unconscious. They have no way of expressing it. All right. Ask about whether the pain is a single location or felt throughout the body. If, the, if it's the entire body, the problem is probably in the bloodstream. If it's a single location, then you're more likely looking at either a muscle issue, an organ issue, something of that sort, something that's local to wherever that pain is at. Do they have any visual disturbances, nausea and vomiting, and you have abdominal cramping, uh, chest pain, shortness of breath, because it kind of starts to narrow down which organs may be being affected. And then, of course, like I said, if they have a pulse, they get a history. They get a uh, sample history, rather. Actually, they get one even if they don't have a pulse. For your physical exam, um, Focus on the major joints, so the elbows, the knees, shoulders. Evaluate their mental status, AVPU. So if they're alert, fantastic. A lot of times they, they will be. Um, you really only start to get into the verbal, painful, and unresponsive if they're really bad off hypoxic. If, the, if it's sickle cell, um, the hypoxia will start to lead them down the, down the drain on their mental status. If it's any of the philias, then it's more likely to be something along the lines of blood loss that's causing it. Right. Get your vital signs and pay close attention to their pulse ox on all of these. All right. Your pulse ox is going to be your telltale vital sign, just like how glucose is your telltale for diabetes. Your pulse ox is a telltale for hem hematologic emergencies. Reassess every five minutes. These are going to be critical patients. If there's bad enough, like I said, the disease is not critical. People live with it. But if something happened for them to call 911, they become critical. So check every five minutes. Um, administer oxygen. Try, like I said, 94 to 99, but try to keep them closer to the 99 at that point, um, just because something's wrong with their transport and with their transport capability in their blood, rather. And then um, work on getting them to the hospital. They may need some pain medicine. They may need penicillin, IV fluid, blood transfusions if it's bad enough. Uh, hospital care for hemophilia is going to be IV therapy for the low blood pressure. Uh, they're just basically going to get fluid. That's it. It'll just be normal saline to try to get their blood pressure up. If that doesn't work, then the doctors are going to give them something like dopamine or norepinephrine to try to medicinally get their blood pressure up. But that's something that, again, that's out of your scope. So, but if that's the treatment, we don't want to sit around on the scene with them because that's just that much longer. They're not getting it. So they need to get to the hospital.
And then the last thing, last couple things, um, is the actual medical care. All that to say this, you're going to give them oxygen, make them comfortable, and send them to the hospital. That's pretty much it. All right. Um, you want to be aware of the other things that those issues can cause and be ready to treat those. That might cause a lot more work on your part. But the, the hematologic emergencies by themselves is just give oxygen, try to make them comfortable, and get them to a hospital. And that's going to be it. Any questions? Well, y'all are a lively group tonight. I do appreciate your. Um, I do appreciate y'all's participation in what we talked about tonight. It's always hard to, especially in these kind of classes, it's hard to talk to a silent laptop or whatever we're using. So the more y'all talk, the more you type, the better the class is because it gives us something to work with as instructors. When I, we first started doing this, we didn't really have any students in the class. Uh, there were nights where we would be teaching to a literally empty room, so there was nobody to answer anyway. But uh, thankfully, that has changed as we changed our policies. So I've got your code. I'm going to type it as well. Uh, that way you guys can see it. Everyone. All right. The code is B is in Bravo. Seven one. Two zero. B is in basic. Seven is in July the seventh month. And then one two zero. Now that's not the code for your test. I don't know what Chris's code is. I'll have to get that from him. But um, that will be the code that you use just for your attendance. And we'll get you guys the code. We'll probably put it out in Discord, so keep an eye on it. All right. If there's no questions, um, we'll call it a night. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now.